Paul, how do you how do you survive today with uh, just how sensitive everybody can be to what we say? I mean, do you feel like you've had to censor yourself way more today than you did 15 years ago? How do you feel like how do you deal with that right now? Well, you know, um, it's interesting. Um, I'm pretty famous for uh, getting people wound up. In fact, in, in CanFit Pro and a couple of other conferences, when they send out the materials to sign up for the class or you see their marketing on the website, my sessions are uh, at X rated, contain swearing, adult language, adult concepts, can be offensive to people. <laughs> no. should not so it's all bring, out there in the open. Do not bring your children. But the problem is, is the conference directors have said to me, they said, you're a paradox because you generate a lot of angry people and nasty letters and but the same people keep coming back to your workshops year after year and lectures, even though they're ones that hated you, but they sit right there in the front row every time. So we, and they said, and you get lots of numbers. So we, we don't really know what to make of you, but we like your educational message. So, you know, if you can just try to tame it a little bit, that'd be great. <laughs> but, you know, an example was with all this stuff. It was funny that you mentioned that because I was just, um, I just gave a two-day workshop for the uh, Pacific College of Oriental, Oriental Medicine's 30th annual symposium or 30th, 30th uh, anniversary. And Penny did say to me just in passing, she goes, you know, there's a lot of stuff with women being very sensitive and Donald Trump's wound everybody up. And she goes, you might want to be careful with what you say. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm just myself. I mean, I'm, I'm, but anyhow... So I'm in class and sure enough, I was talking about how dangerous coffee is and stimulants in general are for females that aren't very stable in their hormonal rhythms and have a good base on them and which usually means they need a minimum of, you know, I like to see a woman to be healthy happily around 16% body fat, not lower. Mm. But when female athletes start dropping lower and lower below that, they right. start having, you know, dysmenorrhea, amenorrhea, all the menorrheic, all the menstrual problems. But I've coached countless females who have just ruined themselves with coffee and chronic use of tea because it stimulates too much adrenaline and too much cortisol. So it antagonizes, you know, cortisol is then, it has a functional relationship with DHEA. And as your cortisol levels rise up, the half-life of cortisol is 400 minutes. So 400 to 500 minutes, depending on how quickly your liver could clear. So if you drink a Starbucks coffee, eight ounce Starbucks coffee, for example, it's 350 milligrams of caffeine. So let's call it 300. If you drink, if you're a woman, let's say, and you drink a cup of Starbucks coffee, right? Let's call it at four o'clock at night, you'll get 300 milligrams of caffeine. 400 minutes later, you'll have half of that. Mm. 400 minutes later, 400 is like, what, four hours? Four mm -hmm. times six is 24. It's more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 minutes in an hour. Uh, 400. It's like six hours, four, something like four that. Four hours, right? Yeah. So if you drink 300 milligrams of caffeine at four o'clock in the afternoon at Starbucks because you're feeling tired, you have 150 milligrams of caffeine still floating around in you at 10 o'clock at night. And then at, what is it, 1 or 2 a.m., 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, you still have 75 milligrams. And so when you have cortisol, when your cortisol levels are not naturally regulated and then don't drop down, melatonin is not released. The cort cortisol and melatonin are antagonistic in the cycle to each other. Just like as the sun's going down, the moon is coming up. And the more light there is in the air, you don't see the moon during the day, even though it's there, you can't see it because it's, it's the sunlight overpowers it. So cortisol and adrenaline are, are really sun-like. And then melatonin and all the anabolic hormones, which come out more strongly at night, typically for growth and repair, are also nighttime hormones. So the more stimulated a woman gets with anything that elevates cortisol and triggers adrenaline, which then elevates cortisol... The, if that's done chronically, the adrenal glands downregulate cortisol production or they stop producing as much um, naturally because they're being stimulated all mm -hmm. the time. So it's like someone that's overtrained eventually collapses. So they go further and further down and the hypothalamic pituitary 
adrenal axis and there's a hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, that regulatory system gets disrupted in his little research shows in physiology that within 7 to 21 days of any repeated influence, you can entrain the system. So within 7 to 21 days, you can actually get addicted to caffeine because it's changing the flow of your hormones and the body becomes expectant upon it to trigger that cascade. And the longer you do it, the longer it takes mm -hmm. to get someone's physiological rhythms to self-regulate and you may never recover after a certain point. In tests with animals, they found that if you take them far enough, then corrective measures won't work. In other words, as long as you don't give them the drug, they're, they're in misery or I, irrational. I, I've tried explaining this to a lot of people, and more recently because of all the studies that are coming out and getting lots of publicity showing that coffee is so healthy for you, so full of antioxidants, which it is. Mm -hmm. However, in some cases, caffeine is not going to be good for you, and it... I, I, in my experience, it's men who tend to be too much stress, not good sleep. Um, but women do seem to be more sensitive to the potential negative effects. Yes. And I find that, that you know, like men's hormone levels or whatnot, they seem to balance out a little faster. And so it's my female clients that I'm more likely to say cut caffeine or reduce caffeine, especially if, if they have symptoms of like estrogen dominance. Which, now, is there, is there a reason why women tend to be more sensitive? Is it just their, their, small, yeah. their lower body mass? No, it's because a woman's body's designed to uh, support two lives at all times. They're, they come to the world to, carry, to create a fetus, right? They have to mm -hmm. grow the baby inside them, and they got to carry it for nine months. So they have to have enough nutrition on board to feed the growth and development of a new body without killing themselves. And if you study you know, the history throughout native cultures of what happens to women that are undernourished or too tired when they get pregnant, it's bad news. Sure. It, it, mm -hmm. can, it can create deformations of the child, every kind of malfunction you can imagine in a child, all the way to being stillborn. And uh, women used to die regularly giving mm -hmm. birth to children because their, their bodies were too spent. In fact, in most, in many native uh, cultures, it was forbidden for a woman to get pregnant by a man more than once every three years because they found that if she got pregnant and gave birth more often than once every three years, it increased significantly increased the likelihood of very serious health problems and lunacy, which is when a woman just gets so exhausted, she can't regulate her unconscious and she just becomes, you know. Now that's interesting because uh, the- Wild. Right after they have a baby, that's one of the most, uh, uh, isn't that one of the most- um, Stressful. No, 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 no. Right after they have a baby, there's a window where they're most likely to get pregnant again, right? It's a higher percentage of them getting pregnant again right after they have a kid. Uh, as long as they're breastfeeding, the yeah, risks go way down mm. because breast, the stimulation of the breast has, I don't remember the exact hormone pathways, I studied it years ago, but as long as the child's milking, you see, and we don't feed children, mothers in our culture don't feed children the way native cultures do. Native cultures carried the babies everywhere mm -hmm. and slung them from their chest mm -hmm. and the kid would just suck a little, fall asleep, suck a little, fall asleep. But Western mothers often try to do it like morning, noon, and night, like, you know, like you're at schedule. in school or something on some kind of schedule. Uh, which the point I'm making is that if a mother does not let her child breastfeed regularly, consistently throughout the day, then the hormonal regulation that allows her to have sex without getting pregnant is disrupted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The more frequently the nipples being, uh, the saliva from the infant triggers off all sorts of biochemicals and just loads of receptors in a woman's nipple that pick up things like the body temperature, the immune messages. It helps regulate which um, antibodies the woman's immune system puts into the milk to protect the child. It's a very wickedly complex system. My second wife, Angie, who's the mother of Mana, our son, studies this extensively. And when she summarizes these books to me, it's like, oh my God, it's like, and you got people telling people not to breastfeed. This is absolutely crazy. I mean, I knew it was just intuitively and naturally. I'm come. I was. I'm a farmer, so animals do that, and without that, you wouldn't survive in nature. So it's sort of sort of a silly idea that women shouldn't breastfeed. But it's it, it's just like our culture. There's a lot of silly silly ideas. But all this, anyhow. So the answer is the, the breastfeed. The more you breastfeed, the less likely you are to get pregnant. 
it takes a hell of a lot of load on a woman's body to give to develop a fetus, give birth to it, mm-hmm. carry it. And all this was me saying to you guys before I forget the whole point <laughs> is that uh, Penny said to me, you be careful when you go give this workshop. So I'm talking and I'm talking to the audience and and I said, you know, women need to be very careful with caffeine. In fact, if a woman has any kind of menstrual problems at all, she should not be using any kind of stimulants because it'll make the problem much worse. And I've t- tested this a thousand times, right? And treated lots and lots and lots of women of all types with diseases who are world-class athletes, whatever. And the first thing I do when I see menstrual problems and ovarian problems and anything else is you off the caffeine, off the stimulants. And there's techniques I use to help them transition, but we won't get onto all that unless you want to talk about that. But anyhow, the point is I'm talking and I'm saying, you know, I said, you women, you know, when you get into this premenstrual state, which a woman whose hormonal system's dysregulated, it's like she's on that her emotional state's very much like premenstrual syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Not, Not an easy ride. And so... I said, now you get a couple of them going in a building and they start harmonizing with their cycles or you're married to a woman who's drinking too much coffee like that. It can be tough. Or you get women together. They can be like cat fighting all the time. So You offended a bunch of... Well, no. I, when, when, <laughs> I, said, I said, by the way, do you guys know the difference between a woman with PMS and an alligator? Oh, and, no. And they said, no. I said, lipstick. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't believe they would get offended at such a. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. You know, the the director of the conference, who they complained you said to, this at a conference, said to me, "Paul, I completely understand. I mean, I could see that it was just a joke, and it was totally in line with what yeah. you were saying educationally. But women these days are so damn sensitive. He says, mm-hmm. I just want you to know because it's my job to let you know they complained. And but but he said, but I liked it. You know, but the thing is, I make jokes like uh, my jokes are always to enhance a point of some kind sure. because people remember things like that. Mm-hmm. But how many people remember, you know, the half-life of fucking cortisol, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, context matters. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Context matters and, and the way you say things matters. Like, yeah. I could say the word pig. Nobody's going to get offended. But if I call you a pig, yeah. then it becomes offensive. And, uh, you know, I... I we're very similar to you. Like I'm an equal opportunity offender. Like, yeah. don't feel special because <laughs> no, I offended no, no, no. you. Because I'm going to offend the opposite person and everybody around you. And it's, it's we're all sharpening each yeah, other. Yeah, that's, that's all good. I feel. But I want to ask you about that. You you mentioned the caffeine and you have methods to helping people. Because I find it so hard to get people to to reduce and then eliminate caffeine because the withdrawal sucks. When yeah. you go off caffeine, it's terrible withdrawal. Mm-hmm. I've suffered it. Um, you know, I was an espresso aficionado and I pushed myself so hard. I mean, Penny and I uh, used to, honestly, we used to, <laughs> there was many days in, in my, you know, our first 15 years together building the Institute, we'd be walking home and the sun was starting to come up and we'd be back to work by about 10 o'clock the next morning. Mm. I mean, I used to, we used to put in 15 hour days regularly and I worked seven days a week for many, many, many years. I mean, I was a man for freaking on fire i i in, you know in Jungian terms i had an archetypal possession i was i had such a profound sense inside of me that i was doing exactly what i came to this world to do and i was doing it for a reason like i chose here It was almost as though i was hanging out of the atmosphere of the earth looking in watching people torture themselves with bad training and bad diet and bad lifestyle and poor medical practices and I just felt so sorry I was like I have got to go work on this problem it just hurts me to watch this happening and so I was just like driven and you know I I grew up so how did you figure out how to wing yourself off or how did you put the method together to to teach others to well what I always do I ask my soul for guidance and I I uh I just meditate on it and wait, get quiet and listen to great spirit. And I say, you know, I'm having this challenge. You know, I love to, I love to love you and work hard and, and, uh, but I've gotten to the point now where I'm, I'm, I can't function without the caffeine and I'm getting worse. I drink it, I get dried out, I get headaches. And so I've had to take myself off of it several times, but it got to the point where 
The last time I took myself off, it took me a year to get my hormonal system to balance. And I was just in pain all the time. And that drove me into, I was just foggy headed and lethargic. Mm. And I had to really use my freaking inner strength to push me through the day to, and be productive. Cause I just felt like I wanted to go fall asleep under a rock and disappear and not talk to anybody. Like my head wanted to collapse. So my soul told me, my soul said, get a handful of your dark, darkest roasted coffee beans. Cause they have more caramelization. So they taste nicer to chew. And my soul said, just take two or three beans and chew them and suck them and try not to swallow them. And sure enough, I found even as little as three coffee beans, if you put them in your mouth and just chew them, like, like people would maybe chewing the, tobacco the leaves, and, yeah. Yeah, and suck on it. And it gives you a homeopathic dose of caffeine. And, and also there's about 40 amino acids in coffee, mm-hmm. not just caffeine that are stimulatory to the nervous system. You know, if you, I've studied Eli's, uh, 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 Ellie, Illy, Illy's book on coffee. Years ago, I studied all sorts of books on coffee raising and Illy talks about exactly what is in espresso that's stimulating, but there's far more than just uh, caffeine in there that is stimulating. Many, many amino acids and catecholamine stimulants in your brain. And so Hmm. anyhow, um, I started experimenting with that and, and I found I never had to use more than 12 coffee beans to get me through the day and knock out the symptoms. And so then I, when I was working with people that needed to come off a of coffee, I said, try this technique. And every single person that's ever tried it has said, oh my God, it's a miracle. It's a, such a simple thing and it works. Then that's how I figured out, you guys know I'm the one that came up with the whole concept of putting butter and oils in coffee years ago. And I taught Laird Hamilton that probably in 2004 or five, I think. Now, what's the benefit of that, of, of putting the book? Because now that's a big thing. Everybody does that now. Yeah. I feel, yeah. Like, I feel like Dave Asprey should owe you like $10 million or something yeah. like that. Well, you know, people think he came up with it, but I, I honestly, I researched extensively. I hire professional researchers to do worldwide literature searches. And I didn't even know anybody was doing that. The only record that I could find was of Tibetans putting yak butter in tea. And I'd already been led to this by my soul before I found out because I once I come up with an idea I then have researchers look into it to see if it's been thought of what are they using it Mm -hmm. just like if I'm doing a patent if I'm Mm -hmm. writing a patent I got to know if there's any anybody else has a patent on this idea but when I did my research there was no mention of it anywhere in the world except Tibet and I had by the time I taught Laird I'd been testing it for a few years but what was happening is I was getting so many athletes and so many housewives and so many executives that were, when I would test them, had real blood sugar handling problems. They would go from high to low blood sugar, and that's very stressful on the pancreas, as you know. And and that's the kind of stuff that leads to syndrome X and then diabetes, type 2 onset, mm-hmm. adult onset diabetes, which is not adult onset anymore. But um, So I... I had done research in naturopathic journals and and books that I have in my library and they talked about, uh, you know, one, you should never drink alcohol on an empty stomach because the alcohol can actually erode the lining of the stomach and lead to ulcers. And also because alcohol skips several stages of the Krebs cycle, it elevates blood sugar even faster than white table sugar and causes huge blood sugar handling problems. And so... One of the things that I found in the naturopathic literature is it's far better to eat cheese or dark, heavy meats like red meat with alcohol because the alcohol is buffered by the fat and the protein. So it doesn't, uh, one, you don't, it don't absorb it as quick. So it doesn't get you super drunk, super fast, uh, which causes problems for people, women more susceptible to it than men. And it also, all that, like I said, that, that much alcohol without a buffer is can I knew just, I was it can something. damage the lining of the stomach. <laughs> Cheese, meat, and alcohol. So <laughs> I, I had already seen that research. So I thought, well, if that's true of alcohol, then we can. And then the other thought that came to me was time release vitamins, chelated vitamins, are you, they use minerals and various other bonding agents to cause a vitamin to release progressively over time. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, what if I could create a time release caffeine delivery system? Well, the natural thing to do is to try a high fat. So because I'm dairy intolerant, I can't do any cream without it really giving me a headache. But I found butter mycelizes in the coffee where all the other oils I tested, such as Brazil nut oil, 
um, macadamia nut oil, peanut oil, coconut oil. Uh, I tested every nut oil you could get a hold of and they all float to the surface. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it doesn't really work very effectively because though you have a food source, the caffeine is not tied up. Mm. But if you put butter in it, because there's just enough dairy protein in butter to draw the calf, draw the liquid of the coffee and the caffeine into it versus like if you put ghee, it'll float to the top. It does. It does separate. But Absolutely. if you put mm. butter yep. right out of the... Like, yeah, if blended, you blend it and you yeah. leave it, it doesn't, you don't get that slick, no. that oil slick on the top it, like it you do with the ghee. It will mix in and cream will mix in perfectly. Mm -hmm. But the protein is pulling the, it's acting like a sponge and drawing mm. things. And now that creates a time release effect because now the caffeine that's tied up in the butter or in the food substance now can only be released as that food is being broken mm -hmm. down. Well, fat can be in your stomach for three to five hours before it's out, but caffeine by itself, coffee by itself, if you had an empty coffee on an empty stump within 20 minutes, it's all full in you, man. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in you, boom, mm -hmm. just like alcohol. So what I was doing is finding a way to protect people from serious blood sugar handling problems because and also it leads people to drinking way more coffee because it takes you up very high and drops you very fast so then they have to reach for another cup to get to that high mm -hmm. again I, I remember i had a lady who was a doctor's wife believe it or not who came to me and her fingernails had all fallen off she'd seen 10 medical doctors and nobody knew what to do with her one of the first things I noticed when I looked through her paperwork, because, you know, I have holistic lifestyle, a lot of forms they have to fill out. It takes them several hours. She was drinking 25 cups of coffee a day. Oh, shit. Whoa. And so she had become severely hypothyroid. You see, as the Whoa. adrenals become more and more fatigued, it triggers a protective reflex in the thyroid. So you go hypothyroid to the degree that you get adrenal exhausted. That's Whoa. how I can tell how, hmm. how far down the line a person is, because I have a score for the magnitude of hypothyroid and the higher that score is the more dangerously exhausted mm. your adrenals are once i see the hype the mm. thyroid going hypothyroid and your body temperature starting to be poorly regulated i know you're already beginning phase three adrenal exhaustion it's mm. classically seen as phase one which is elevated cortisol phase two which is temporary loss of cortisol natural cortisol production using a 24-hour cortisol rhythm cycle where you take it every uh, you take it four times in 24 hours, uh, 6 a.m., noon, it's broken right. up. Saliva, right? Yeah, saliva yeah. testing. And then, um, so phase two, you're down in one or more of those cycles. So you might have low morning cortisol. That would mean you're into phase two. Mm -hmm. If you have high cortisol, it means you're in stage one adrenal exhaustion because you're overdriving the system. Okay. Stage three means you have... Uh, chronically low cortisol in multiple of the four checks and your ratio of cortisol to DHEA is disrupted beyond the reference range. Now, I have a question about this because I know there are certain compounds that help your body utilize cortisol better and it seemed, they seem to lower cortisol, if you will. Adaptogens. Adaptogens, yeah. like ashwagandha yeah. is, a, is an example. Licorice root. Would ashwagandha be something that you wouldn't want to use if you weren't producing a, a lot of cortisol? Let's say you're in that stage three, stage four. Is it more appropriate for stage one or is it are adaptogens appropriate throughout that whole cycle because they help balance things well, out? Well, adaptogens spare cortisol. Okay. Like if you take licorice root as one of the herbs I use with pregnenolone which is the precursor to cortisol so you you get uh it goes from cholesterol to progesterone to pregnenolone then you get what's called pregnenolone steel and there's a pathway uh, pregnenolone is pulled out of the sex hormone pathway by the adrenals to manufacture uh glucocorticoids so that's why as you get more and more stressed your body cannot manufacture both sex hormones effectively and cortisol effectively. But since cortisol is a survival hormone, adrenaline, cortisol, first. and insulin are your three hormones you mm. must have or you'll die. The rest of them are secondary. So pregnenolone steel is the name of the pathway where uh, pregnenolone is stolen on its way to becoming a sex hormone and diverted to the adrenals to make the glucocorticoid stress hormones. So if your stress levels 
are high enough that your body cannot does not have the resources to manufacture the stress hormones and the sex hormones, your sexual performance and your recovery ability mm -hmm. starts dropping and dropping, dropping because you're driving the cortisol fight or flight pathway so strongly. And the body says, if you're that stressed, it's not a good time to be reproducing children anyhow. So right. it tries to protect you from doing what Americans do all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and adaptogens spare that? So adaptogens generally spare cortisol. So for example, if I'm working with someone that's got adrenal exhaustion, I might have them take licorice root because it makes, uh, it allows the body to use less cortisol. So the same amount oh, of cortisol lasts longer in the blood. It's like it extends its shelf life as a metaphor. So you can help people feel better than they normally would because if the body uses X amount of cortisol per unit of time, now with the adaptogen, they have that X amount of cortisol per a longer unit of time before they go into withdrawal type mm. experiences. But if you use adaptogens when you're high cortisol, it'll make lots of cortisol stay in the system too long, which would cause a tremendous increase in the likelihood of you not getting into deep restorative sleep. You'd be one of these person that's kind of tired and wired and mm lays in bed waiting to fall asleep and then you finally fall asleep and you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you can tell it's really far down the line when you wake up sweating mm. and then you usually can't get ever deep and all of a sudden right about five minutes before the alarm goes off you're having a deep sleep and you really get pissed off when you got to get up because you're like finally i just fell asleep so that's what happens when people are using adaptogens while they're high cortisol because they're uh, the environment. They don't know how to manage themselves or the environment. Yeah, the reason why I was asking is I love, uh, for me personally, when I take anything, with, and I'm sensitive to caffeine, so I can't, I don't take as much as the average person. It only takes me 150 to 200 milligrams, and I'm, I'm buzzed. I'm I'm wired. Whereas other people, you know, 300, 400 is what they'll what they'll end up with, or even higher. Yeah. But I notice when I take caffeine with. Well, theanine, and if I combine it with ashwagandha, I get a much smoother ride. I don't get that super high peak in that drop. So that's why I was asking how the ashwagandha or the, how the adaptogen will help, or maybe not help. Well, it, like I say, if you're if you've got too much cortisol in you, it'll magnify that experience because okay. it'll prolong the shelf life of the cortisol in your bloodstream. That's my experience of it, mm. uh, having what? looked into this and tested lots of these things. Uh, but there is a fair bit of individuality, just like in one family. If you look at uh, Roger Williams' book, Biochemical Individuality by Roger Williams, he shows, for example, there's 19 different types of stomachs you find in people. He he showed that within one family, the same parent from the same parents, there can be a 1,000 fold difference in the ability for the liver to clear any toxin, such as alcohol. So what I'm saying is you and me could be twin brothers, but you could have a very different reaction to caffeine than me. Mm. I'm like you. Once I cleaned myself up, got off of it for a good year or two and didn't touch it while I got healed, I found that if I drink more than one shot of espresso a day that I get addicted. Mm. So I Keep make it, it a little. habit to like leave maybe a third or a little bit and pour it down the sink so... I stay under that threshold, but a typical espresso shot out of a standard machine is 40 to 70 milligrams of caffeine. So if you did a triple shot espresso that and filled the rest of the cup with hot water, that would still only be about 210 milligrams of caffeine. A Starbucks drip coffee at eight ounces is 350 milligrams mm -hmm. of caffeine. So here's the point I'm making. A person who wants to reduce caffeine is far better to go to an Americano and put a shot or two of espresso and add hot water. One, the flavor richness is even better. Two, the shorter the exposure time to the water, the less caffeine you get and the less toxins you pick up. So I tell people always use organic coffee because it's one of the most heavily sprayed crops in the world and you're extracting toxins out of it with hot water water and un under pressure with an espresso machine but if you use a couple of shots of espresso chase it up with water and make it the size you would normally like a coffee you're going to get far less caffeine and you get less toxic exposure the longer the water's exposed to the bean like drip coffee can be exposed to the beans for five six seven minutes right 
So you're leaching lots more caffeine out of it. And it's uh, more drying to your body because you're bringing a lot of volume in. That's why the cold cold brew is so much stronger in caffeine. They leave it there to brew for overnight, and it yeah. just it just absorbs more or, or, or takes out more of the caffeine. Yeah. Do you find you've been doing this for a long time? Mm. Do you find more and more people today are suffering from the effects of just uh, terrible stress regulation? Is it worse mm. today than it was when you first came in, or yeah. would you say it's okay? It is. It is because. Because we have to remember that the body summates stress, right? Everything in your body's experience is added up. There's no for way you can go into the gym and leave your uh, financial problems, your challenge with your wife, your kid's illness, or your parents being in an old folks' home and, and calling you every 20 minutes, begging you to come visit them. You, you, you cannot leave those things at the door. Your electromagnetic pollution, your internal toxicity, the toxicity of foods, the toxicity of building chemicals, I don't care what it is, it all summates in the human body. So how your hormonal system is responding is based on the sum total perception of stress in your entire body and environment. So it's all stress. It's all, it's all, in other words, every person's reaction to stress goes up if there's more chemicals in the, in the environment. If there's a social stress or like say Donald Trump says, we're going to start a third war or we're going to, third world war, we're going to keep drilling for oil and the rest of us with a couple of brain cells or more holding hands go, wait a minute, we don't need more carbon in the air. And this guy named Tesla gave us free energy technology a long, long time ago, and you guys just shelved it along with many others like Keeley and the list is long. So it's not that we don't we don't freaking need oil. We need you to actually stop hoarding the advanced technologies that were given to us by the geniuses that are part of the family of humanity. So my I'm only ad libbing this to make a point. If these kinds of things are important to you and you have the knowledge to see that the world's in deep shit right now, it stresses you out. Mm. So how you respond to anything in your environment is based on the sum total of the stressors your body's experiencing physically, emotionally, and mentally. So when we look at facts like 95 to 98% of the U.S. population is only two paychecks from bankruptcy because people have, they're in the habit of spending far more money than they make. And we've got all the predatory lending and predatory use of credit cards. We've got high levels of electromagnetic pollution. I mean, we, we're, we experience a level of electromagnetic pollution today that is like, you know, if you were alive for 2 million years prior to the last 100 years, you wouldn't have experienced what you can get in one day here. I mean, I'm generating that as an example, but it's not factual but we're under shitloads of electromagnetic stress and with the 5g system coming out oh my god um one of my friends and in, in who's Isn't it like a hundred times more paul Is it it's a, it's thousands of times wow more. It's I, I, thousands I, I, of times more than it was in 1900 it's right in um the book the body electric by robert o becker he shows it up to like 1990 something but if you look at uh the Tinfoil User's Guide to Electromagnetic Pollution by Nicholas Pino. I might have got the title wrong, Nicholas Pino. Uh, he's a guy that's done some of my courses, and I interviewed him. His book's excellent, but it's a very good book. Uh, you should really look into it. You should interview him. Mm. Um, and uh, he shows the current statistics, but when you see what's going to happen with the 5G antennas and stuff— we're all going to be literally walking around in the equivalent of a worldwide microwave oven. I mean, and, and this, you know, these, these frequencies are turning the water molecules and agitating your water molecules, which are wickedly sensitive to vibration. And they, you know, for example, years and years ago, uh, actually, you know, um, probably three or four years ago, I was having so much pain in my neck. There it is. Oh, there's the book. The non-tenfoil non 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 -foil guide. Yeah, the non-tenfoil oh, yeah. guide to EMFs. Yeah. So a few years ago, um, I was studying this and I came across research showing that electromagnetic pollution by wireless systems caused a huge increase in inflammation in the body. And, you know, I think I told you guys years ago, I had a guy fall on my head when I was doing a lifting stunt and right. it blew out my C5, 6 and 6, 7 discs, tore a bunch of ligaments, pinched my spinal cord, shut the whole left side of my body off. 
And I lost 24 pounds of muscle in like four weeks because I couldn't even carry a briefcase. Well, that was a freaking hard thing to rehab. You know, my neck was, a surgeon would have wanted to fuse it right away. But I used to be in so much pain at night. I couldn't find a comfortable position. My neck would ache like hell. My wife can tell you, I would wear completely through a bed sheet in about three months, just wear it till there was a hole in it. Well, after I found this research and said, okay, Penny, let's try shutting the wireless system off at night. The first night she shut it off, man, I remember waking up in the morning, jumping out of bed going, oh my God, I slept all night and I feel freaking great. What the hell? That wireless system's been jacking the shit out of me. Now, if she ever forgets to turn it off, man, I am like a Christmas goose all night. I'm all jacked up. I'm, my, I'm rolling in bed all night. It used to drive Penny crazy because I, I would just be rolling constantly in bed in pain. But once we started shutting the wireless system off, it was a freaking massive improvement in how much deeper of a rest I got. And because it wasn't stimulating all this inflammation in my body, hmm. I was healing and I started recovering from training better. Hmm. And so I'm thinking, I know what a wireless system in a house can do. What are we going to have happening to our kids and on the animals? I mean, I was in Alaska recently on vacation, right? I'm in Seward, Seward, Alaska, way the hell out in the middle of nowhere. And they've got cell phone coverage so good we took a helicopter way up in the mountains and we're like miles out of town and you can turn your phone on and you got five bars anywhere <laughs> wow. on the hiking trail i'm like this is crazy yeah, i can only get two at my house that's crazy <laughs> that's I, I was blown away i'm like i am in the middle of freaking nowhere if i did not have a compass right now it would be easy to get lost out here and I've got full mm. cell signals. I'm like, this, the, all the animals out here are being drowned in electromagnetic pollution. And it, look. It's a big experiment. It really is. It is. It, it is a big experiment. And even the even the leading researchers will say, we don't really know. We'll, yeah, we'll we don't probably know, know in about 20 or 30 years. Well, you aren't going to make it that yeah, long. We're already yeah. losing, like Steiner said in, in like 18... 90 or something like that there's two things human life depends on and when they get to critically low levels we're in deep trouble those two things are bees and trees and we have already wiped out the tree population way beyond safe limit and the bees are dying all over the world and i've looked at lots of the research and the two things that come up consistently pesticides and electromagnetic mm -hmm. pollution mm -hmm. right and when I do it shamanically and connect to the oversoul of the bee and ask what's going on, you know what the answer I got was? We are tired. We cannot rest because everywhere we go at night, the sky is lit up and there's so much electricity that our bodies cannot rest. We are unable to sleep anymore. So anywhere... You know, this is shamanic interpretation. Sure, sure. I mean, if you're a left This is you talking to the bees, you're saying. Yes. <laughs> I, I connect to the oversoul of the bees. And, and the bee family is my first chakra power animal. So I have a connection. Ever since I was a kid, for example, I had a real intimate connection with bees, which I don't know why. I didn't know why. Now I know why, because it, I have a spiritual connection to them. But like when I was a kid one time, there was a swarm of bees coming at me and my brothers and, and sisters. We were outside doing some playing in a field in an old abandoned house, actually. And I said to them, don't swing at the bees because if you hurt one of them, they le release a scent that tells all the other ones that you're a danger and they'll come, you know, mass attack you. And I already knew this as a kid. And so they would run away but i would just stay and i literally one time was covered from head to toe with bees as thick as you can imagine like those bee beards. just crawling all over me yeah. my fear was that they were going to climb up my nose into my nostrils or get in my ears but i just kept blowing air out but i didn't feel scared at all i actually had this sort of a sense of um being loved by nature almost as if like you know when a dog licks you out of affection sure. or mm -hmm. your horse rubs its face against yours to say i love you i mean i've had a lot of these potent experiences because i was raised on a farm and lived with animals right and we used to raise all the ones that that we that the mothers couldn't handle because they either had too many or the or there was an injury or a sickness so we would raise lambs and goats and all sorts of stuff in the house. I mean, our living room was like a, you know, the holy manger where everybody that was like the outcast got raised up. 
So the the point that I'm really making is is that I wanted to, to ask as a human being, you know, what's going on? What are we human beings doing that I, I need to know about so I can help educate people? And that's what the the oversoul of the bee told me was that they're they're exhausted and that the night sky almost everywhere now glows. I mean, have you ever been in an airplane landing in a city and you're a hundred miles from where you're going to land and the sky is just light? You can look right. at satellite yeah. pictures of the earth mm -hmm. at night and it's just lit up like a like a Christmas ornament from and and you see the lights everywhere from outer space like we are literally lighting the sky at yeah, night people will argue that there was a lot of that humans have always been under lots of stress like needing to get food needing to find shelter mm -hmm. war illness but it's a different kind of stress isn't it like you get chased by a bear and then you survive the bear's mm -hmm. gone no more threat no more yeah. stress versus this l like low level constant all the time type of stress those kinds of arguments really are often more academic than actual and mm -hmm. what i mean by that is uh there's a book called Ten Thousand years from uh, metabolic man Ten Thousand years from eden by charles heiser warthen w-o-r-t-h-e-n who is a, a naturalist and a uh, i can't remember what else his criteria his title are it's a very good book but he shows, for example, that the average native culture could meet or tribe could meet its daily food requirement and get what it needed done to survive in about three and a half hours a day on average. So they typically would start with sunrise. And by the time 10 o'clock came around, they had done their work for the day and spent the rest of the day singing, dancing and playing with the children. Mm. Hmm. There's the book. So Put the, that in the show notes. That sounds like a cool schedule. You know, and he looks at several cultures in there, and I've got many books like this looking into cultures. So a lot of these are ideas that people get from reading a couple of magazines or hearing somebody with a with, with a with a bias talk about it. But when you actually do the research, and, and I've visited many of the native tribes people all over the world up the coast where i came from in british columbia our, my parents business was selling wool to them to mm -hmm. the to the spinners and the weavers in these tribes so by no means did they have a hard time meeting what their basic needs were remember they you know they lived in tents and things like that so it's not like they had expensive electrical bills and you know cars to pay for and you know so uh, just like today you would think if you were a healthy person, it's normal to get out of bed and go for a run or go to the gym. Well, they would just go hunting and mm -hmm. gathering, right? So all in all, pound for pound, if you're a fit, healthy person today, you're just doing the same shit that they would have been doing, but you're putting the work applied into a gym or to getting other things done. And, you know, going hunting, I grew up in a hunting culture and I'm my father's a hunter and I've been out hunting when you go hunting, you walk very slowly and quietly. You're not out fucking doing an endurance jog through the woods or the animals go, oh, who's the dumb fuck coming? You can hear him a quarter of <laughs> a mile away. He's going to starve to death. We feel so sorry for him. We'll we'll leave a little shit here just to say, hi, dumb shit. <laughs> we were here way before you. Um, you know, so the point I'm making is it's not like you're out doing some kind of a physically exerting thing. The most exerting thing of a hunt is carrying the meat back home, you know, right? Because... You can't just shoot it and tell it to follow you home. You've got to carry that back home. So the, do you see the point I'm making, though? The point is is that we, we worked to create the safety and security we needed, which wasn't nearly as hard as what we're doing today when you all things considered, like how many people are overspent? Lots of them. How many people are eating shit and have no energy and overstimulating themselves and taking drugs that they don't need and not addressing the real issues. In other words, when you look at how much energy is going into living foolishly, well, we're working way harder to survive than they were. When someone comes to you with these symptoms of like just too much, overtired, you know, overworked, overstimulated. You mean everybody. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, and probably, probably a little bit of a, a bias, right? People who come seek you out or probably been to everybody else. So you're getting the cream of the crop, if, so to speak. But 
What are, what's like the first thing you look at? What's the first thing you, you, cause I noticed as a trainer through the years of training people that as I did this longer and longer, I started to simplify and simplify. Mm-hmm. You know, when I first started, it was like, I throw everybody but the kitchen sink at them. Yeah. As I got more experienced, I realized, okay, now first thing I need to do is, is let's just look at adding some vegetables to your diet or let's do this basic exercise and it became more effective. What are some of the first things that you look at when someone comes to you? Well, I use a, a health, I use a series of questionnaires. It's very, what I do is quite complex. I mean, it takes me hours to read through all the intake paperwork. So I use a health appraisal questionnaire that analyzes them in 29 different body systems, such as the adrenals, the liver function, uh, key emotions like anger or anxiety or fear, um, menstrual balance. Uh, it's got questions for male sex hormones, female sex hormones, estrogen levels, uh, hypoth- high, how high, much hypothyroid symptoms do they have, digestion, uh, elimination, uh, nervous system. I mean, there's 29 systems and it totals up how stressed they are and shows me exactly how stressed they are on a scale of low to dangerously high for each of these systems. So I analyze that. Um, but the thing that I'm looking for first is do they have a clear sense, what I call a dream? Do they have a clear sense of direction in their lives? Do they have something that they're really working for or what I call a dream? Because it doesn't matter what you find or how good of a doctor or a therapist you are. If the person doesn't have a clear sense of why they want to be better, what is it that I'm, you know, like, for example, if you couldn't use your leg for some reason because you love to exercise, it would be very irritating for you. So you'd probably be quite motivated to get that leg working. Mm-hmm. But if someone finds all of a sudden they're getting more love and attention than they ever have since their leg isn't working, well, they're not really motivated to go to a therapist and heal. In yeah. fact, they might not do the stretches and home exercises because they make, you know, they're adult enough to know, hey, if I can drag this out, you know, my therapist gives me massages. They talk to me. It's the first time I've had real someone really pay attention to me. So for a lot of people, that's a rare experience. And, and a lot of people don't have enough confidence in themselves that they can ever do what they want to do or they've been too beat down as children or uh, and they just become insecure. There's a long list of things that happen to people. But so more important to, to me than anything that I find objectively through lab testing or uh, objectively as it can be through questionnaires or subjectively through, through my own uh, assessment and discussions with them, I know that the first thing I've got to do is help them identify something that – they love enough to do that healing becomes a labor of love Mm -hmm. and a process in which they're creating something they're excited to contribute to each day because without that the best doctors and the best therapists in the world have a fraction of a chance of getting you better and no matter how much supplements and you know scientifically cool stuff you give them all it does is fortify the same behavior that got them in trouble. Mm. I know, and I know you've actually worked with some people who've been paralyzed and have uh-huh. had severe head trauma yep. and things like that. And so yes. what, what do you find, uh, how do you start that healing process with them? I know that's like one of those really super difficult situations to Do you, do you mean from a with. psychological perspective All of or, or a physical perspective? Physical mainly. Well, I analyze them and look at things like key reflexes. Um, for example, if someone's uh, say, uh, below the neck, uh, paralyzed, um, but I find I can still activate uh, spinal reflexes like tendon reflexes, which I can test with a reflex hammer, then I will actually, in their rehab sessions, spend lots of time activating the spinal reflexes all along the multifidus and the rotatories and the uh, interspinalis muscles, the erector spinae muscles, as you would generally call them, mm-hmm. because... Every time I strike that with a trigger, that stretch reflex through the spindle cell with a reflex hammer, which is exactly what you do when you do a patella reflex. Like repetition. I'm actually exercising the muscle, and there's I'm putting impulses, just like you said, through the neural pathway. So the system actually doesn't believe that it's dying, Hmm. and it actually can maintain muscle mass, and I can trick it into developing strength because 
if I can generate a signal from a reflex, the brain can pick it up through the sensory system. Mm -hmm. And it says, wait a minute, there's activity down there. And they start paying attention to each other. Mm. But I also use infant development assessment. So I, I look to see where they're at on the scale of infant development movements. And so then I can choose to um, introduce specific infant development technologies as exercises. So sometimes I have people that are all the way back in, in utero. And oh, so wow. I, I hold them in my lap and I sit on a Swiss ball and I hold them like I would hold the child in my arms and I rock them and oh, I wow. move them in different directions to activate the vestibular system and trigger writing responses so we can be injured at different levels, right? Mm -hmm. Just like if a nerve gets compressed mildly, the first fibers that go are sensory. So if someone has a mild L5S1 uh, nerve root compression from a disc bulge, let's say, they might have sensory loss in the L5 dermatome, but not motor loss or not autonomic loss. Mm -hmm. If the pressure is significant more then they'll have sensory loss and motor loss, but still may have autonomic function because in each nerve bundle, the autonomic fibers are buried the deepest for that very reason. Nature's protecting those fibers because they're the ones you got to have to survive. Mm -hmm. But if someone, for example, has edema in that distribution and I take do what's called a matchstick test, I can take and poke a matchstick into your skin and a normal person within about 60 seconds, you won't see where the matchstick was. But I've actually had patients that came back three days later and I could see exactly where the matchstick well, was. Wow. It's actually left divots in them. That tells you that the sensory, motor, and autonomic fibers are being compressed and that the nerves in great jeopardy of serious injury. Mm. So when I look at people, I can use various tests to say, well, how deep is the injury mm -hmm. and what system do i have back. access to so i see if i can work from the inside of the tree out so to speak mm -hmm. versus everyone else keeps trying to come from the outside in and i can use manual therapy i can take them and i can induce reflexes like i said on the swiss ball i can put them on a roller there's a lot of ways i can activate the system and the thing that i tell them to do if they're in a wheelchair, as I say, stop using the wheelchair except for when you absolutely have to mm -hmm. because most of them get quickly, shall we say- Adapted. Adapted to the idea that that's it. I'm never going to walk again or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they sit in the wheelchair and start to rot. And I say, look, if you can drag yourself around on your elbows, then put some elbow pads on and make it fun. Make it a workout, you know? do as much as you can do physically any way you can because that's turning the system on and all that time they're moving the rest of their body so for example you know we have proprioceptors around all our joints right you have uh type one type two type three type four mechanoreceptors around all your ligaments and connective tissues around joints and the proprioceptive system is a very fast system, but it's not part of it. Is it's slightly separate from the normal neural pathways. So, for example, you might have someone that can't consciously move a leg, but if I plantar flex and dorsiflex their ankle, the brain knows it's moving. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they can't move it. Mm -hmm. You see, but when I move it, the brain knows it's moving. Perceives it as being moved. Yes, and and they know it's being moved. They can close their eyes and say, "Okay, my foot's being moved," but mm -hmm. they may not be able to move their own foot when they're sitting here trying to move it. So the point I'm making is if I can activate a pathway where any part of the brain locks onto the fact that there's movement there. It recognizes it. I have a, a now I, I've got neural pathways that I can start connecting to and progressively grow mm. the brain to getting involved. In other words, I can trick Gee, the that's, system. That's fascinating. fascinating taking it from yeah, a developmental standpoint of like going all the way back and kind of recreating yeah. that. And that I can use electrical again. stimulation. I can use indwelling uh, acupuncture needles. Like I can take a, a, a Japanese, I use, I, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when I was working in, in a physical therapy clinic in a surgical center, we had 13 uh, orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons in our own surgical center. They did full blown surgeries there. Um, the doctors had such a hard time hitting trigger points with the various canes, mitocaine, lower canes, xylocaine, et cetera. 
and they would have to call me into the room to find the trigger points for them and hold them. And then I would mark them with a surgical pen so they knew right where to stick the needle because they kept missing all the time. So they got together and said, uh, look, why don't we send Paul to physician's assistant school and get him licensed to give medical injections? So I did. I went to physician's assistant school. I met the California state criteria to give medical injection. As long as I have a physician's prescription, I can give an injection. So they would then have me do all the injections. They would just send people to me. And I found that the hypodermic needles were damaging the tissue so much that the pain from the injection was often as bad as what I was treating. So I took some training from a guy named C. Chan Gunn, a medical doctor in Seattle on Japanese dry needling techniques where you use an acupuncture needle with a bit thicker shaft so you can go in and actually break up the fibrous tissue with the tip of needle. Hmm. You can mobilize scar tissue and do all sorts of things. But the point I'm making is you can take traditional electroacupuncture systems or you can use magnetic pulse therapy or you can use needles and, and low uh, amperage, low, low frequency stimulation to turn, just like you use a TEN system. So imagine if, if I can get the brain to be aware of the part that the person thinks is no longer accessible by moving it myself as a therapist, but then I can trick the muscles into firing while I'm doing the movements. You see the brain starts to associate every starts time. Starts to connect the two. It starts to connect the two, and so it stimulates new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is that's always the limiting thing is, is that this is a lot of work for the injured person. And so I know if they don't have a big enough dream that they're never going to do the work to do it. And I've worked with several that basically just decided they would rather be broken. Mm. But I've also worked with people that went for it and really got great results. Can you talk about uh, you were in a movie with one of your uh, well, clients? That, yeah, uh, that was that? Danny Way, who's actually the second person I'll be interviewing for my new podcast right behind yeah. the number one. Yeah. Mind pump. We're number one. Mind pump. <laughs> <laughs> we're so uh, competitive. Yeah. Um, so Danny Way uh, came to me when he was 19 and he uh, had – he was a competitive surfer. He was a competitive motocross racer and a competitive skateboarder all at the same time at elite, you know, at world-class level on, in all sports. And um, he got driven into the bottom of the ocean and hyperflexed his neck so bad that it traumatized his spinal cord. And uh, it caused him to be a paraplegic. And it was very scary for him. And so after about two weeks of laying in bed, a bunch of his surf buddies said, you should go see, they called him the surf doctor who was a chiropractor. So he went to see this guy and the guy did not do a thorough enough assessment on him and didn't realize that he already had bleeding, a contusion of his spinal cord and he get a chiropractic manipulation on his oh. neck. And within a few minutes, he became a quadriplegic. And so for about two weeks, he was a quadriplegic. Well, um, after this had been going on for six months, uh, yeah, there's a picture of him right there jumping the Great Wall of China. Mm, so yeah, awesome. so awesome. And that's after, years after I rehabbed him. He, he sent, he's uh, set, I think, three <laughs> Guinness Book of World Records. Yeah, you got to check that out wow. uh, on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> so anyhow, he heard through some surfers because I had worked and rehabilitated some surfers and uh, I've worked with a lot of top guys like Laird Hamilton for many years but one thing led to another and and, and actually Danny's the one that later re referred Laird to me but um, he got to me and when he came to me he could barely stand on a skateboard even on flat ground in fact he was scared to even stand on a skateboard and you saw the, that's how mm -hmm. high skill his you saw him jump the great wall of china so imagine a guy that cannot stand on his own skateboard and he was in very very tough shape but i had worked with lots of these i'd studied the neck inside out you know i i the neck was a region that i just uh, naturally seemed to have a um, an aptitude for and I'd studied it a lot. I've done five cadaver dissections in my career. So I, I know the anatomy really well, what it looks like, what it feels like. So when he came to me and I felt what was going on, I just intuitively sensed, I know what to do for you. Um, I've seen lots of these kinds of problems at various magnitudes, whether it be, you know, I've had like fighter jet pilots that have had problems with their neck from the way the ejection seat sits and messes with their necks all the time and 
car accident victims, motocross racing, ex game athletes. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people come to see me and pretty, you know, messed up, lots of head injuries. Um, so I rehabbed him and, uh, it took me four months, three to four ser- therapy sessions a week, sometimes hour, an hour and a half. I taught Danny how to eat. I taught how to, I taught him how to manage himself. And he went back and won his first contest back. He made $25,000, won it. And that was four months after the day he walked in to see me. Wow. That's awesome. So in his movie, his movie about his life waiting for lightning, we, they asked me to reenact that that experience of him first coming to me all beat up and barely able to walk. So that was my first movie role. Oh, yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yeah. You know, when we first when we first sat down and met with you, which is what, two and a half, maybe three years ago, I think it, it might have been two and a half years ago yeah, or so. could be. When we sat down, I remember thinking like, this guy, he, he's, he knows so much. He's so... I've always referred to you as the the godfather of wellness, and I knew that once you would expose yourself to the new media world, podcasting and whatever, YouTube, that it was just a matter of time before you exploded. And then recently out, before we did this show, we were out out of the studio and I asked you how well your courses are doing, and you're saying that they're the more podcasts you get on, yeah. the better they are. How's yeah. the reception been now that you, because you were on our show and then I've seen you everywhere yeah. mm-hmm. and you're, you've been all over the place and you yeah, can't, it's been great, man. Are, has it been polarizing? Are you, is it more positive? Is it negative? Is no, it just, it's been amazing. Um, you know, naturally a guy like me gets people wound up and, you know, people that don't want to hear me say the things look i just share my knowledge i've been at this for over 32 freaking years and i've you guys know you've been in my library and anyone that knows me knows i'm not you know i'm not a a hot air guy i'm about getting shit done and i got the proof to show it from speaking to worlds from all over the world to rehabbing top athletes and working for the best sports teams in the world you don't get rehired seven times by the chicago bulls if you're a moron right (laughs) um so um it's actually been amazing. You know, one of the most common comments I get is I came to your institute because I heard you on such and such a podcast and you were the first person that made sense to me. <laughs> You're the first person that could show me how the whole thing works together. Or they say, you're the first person whose discussions about what God is and what spirituality and what religion are, are something that makes me feel good inside not confused and you also understand the body and life itself and i've been looking for someone to teach me how it all goes together and and that's what i spent my life doing is like hey look it's all there's there is no you know it, separation is an illusion that we have to maintain at great expense right the ego is not only is the ego the most important thing you'll ever have, because without in individuality, how can you actually create love? Right? If, if I was a woman and I didn't know I was me, i.e. have an ego, how would I really be conscious that I'm making love to you in a relationship? You see my point? Right. Without you indi- have to have it. Without individuality, unity as a concept means nothing. Just like north without south doesn't mean anything. So what we think of as enlightenment is the pursuit of the conscious awareness of oneness with all that is. Unity, right? I am one. I, uh, I am that I am, right? Mm-hmm. Or in Hinduism, I am that. Or you are that. So... If we don't have an ego to sense our individuality and have a unique conscious awareness of our own experience, there is no way we can share love. I define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self or other. Love is the flow of energy and information. If I'm loving you, you're feeling energy. You know the feeling when you're being loved and there's information, right? Because you know someone's not trying to harm you. You you, you know that they're smiling. Whatever is, there's always energy and information. Empathic means to feel the other. Compassionate means to understand the other. 
So love is the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other. You can't love someone else more than you can love yourself. So first you got to love yourself or you really don't know what it is you're giving to the other person. Mm -hmm. So all of that's based on an ego. How would I know that I was loving me if I didn't have an ego? I would just be like, uh, you know, uh, the leg of a centipede <laughs> or a sea cucumber or the 20th pig in the litter, you know, it's like. So when you, when you, when you're getting new students into your, your schools, into your, your courses and they're coming, you're getting more of them now because you're out more on these podcasts. Yeah. Do you have you identified what attracts more students? Is it when you talk about biology, physiology, nutrition, and exercise, or is it when you talk about this kind of stuff? It's, or is it all of it? Well, it's all of it. But uh, my observations from because we have the instructors ask these questions: Why are you here? Yeah. What who refer, what, what brought you to the Czech Institute? And the most common reason is Paul Cech was the first guy that explained God and spirituality in a way that I could understand and buy into and see when I looked out into the world and believe in. And that made me want to know more and wanted me to share that with others. And his message is holistic. And I really think that's needed in the world right now. That's a paraphrase of the most common comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like we moved away from that for so long, but now it seems like people are trying to move back towards towards uh, what people would call the esoteric. Mm -hmm. There seems to be much more of an interest in it now. than. than well, you know, we, we have to because, look, let me ask you a question. You know, you've got the esoteric, which means the hidden, and we've got the... Well, you got the microphone in front of you and you got your pants on and you got your car and your money in the bank account and you've got scientific materialism as the opposite end of the esoteric, right? Mm -hmm. So without the hidden, then you have to ask yourself, what's making all this animate m a matter animate? What makes the trees grow? What makes the plants grow? What makes the bees' wings buzz? What makes you uh, uniquely you, 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 and you you and why do you have certain likes and loves and you don't and some of us like women of a certain nature and some of us want one kid no kids or 10 kids you know so we we uh we have this quest to understand it seems like there's that quite more and more people are seeking that out now than ever before and i feel like it's because science has given us everything that we think we've wanted and it hasn't given us the answers that our heart wants. Yeah, mm. and I feel like people are like, wait a minute, like, okay, I, I have a job, I got a house, I have enough food, yeah. mm -hmm. I can watch TV, I got my cell phone with all the information that, you know, recorded of mankind, Yeah, and I'm miserable. Yeah. Well, if, if, we, if we don't grow our sense of connection to something beyond ourselves... It becomes stifling and meaningless. Look, look at all the rich people and famous people that committed suicide, mm -hmm. right? How do you get to be as rich and famous as Elvis Presley and not want to live? How do you get as famous as Michael Jackson and rich as Michael Jackson and not want to live? And the list is very long of musicians, of actors, of politicians, mm -hmm. of business moguls, and... and the reality of it is, is that the soul is never satiated by anything other than what it is. But if you study Plotinus, who is an amazing Greek philosopher, one of my favorite, Plotinus is a deep dude. And Plotinus said, um, he said, the soul's first addiction is to matter. Because the soul is ultimately consciousness within. It's the only difference between God and a soul is the word I. If there was no I, then all of us would be like the legs of an octopus and God would be the consciousness of the octopus as a metaphor. But because we have an I, our experience of our own inner life and our own relationships and our own smelling, like when you smell wool, you have a unique experience. I might think it's like yours, but it's not yours. If you eat chocolate, 
I can only assume that what's happening to you when you eat chocolate is what's happening to me. But when we use physiological analysis of this, we find there's actually quite a bit of differences between between people, right? Not everybody likes chocolate. Mm. Um, Crazy people. What don't if like everything chocolate? like yeah. tastes like chicken? Some people don't mean? like people playing with their rectum. Other people dig it, yeah, right? Justin. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but so. Call me out. Uh. I forgot where the hell we were. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you threw yourself off your own. You joke. made the rectum yeah. joke. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, you know, it's funny. You talked about you. You need to connect with that other esoteric side. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Thank to you. To find meaning, and yeah, it, you yeah. know what's, you know what it makes me think of. It makes me think of people, the average person who's chasing money and chasing these material things. There's a little bit of meaning because there's they're always chasing it. But then when you become famous and rich, yeah. You lose that little bit of kind of fleeting meaning, meaning because now you've got it all and you're still sitting there feeling depressed. Well, what mm. happens is is you keep trying to get that buzz going, yeah, right? It's it like, yes. Uh, for example- It's a bottomless pit though. Yeah, it is, right? And so the point that I was trying to make before I lost my trade of thought is Plotinus warned that the soul's greatest addiction is to matter because it gives it something tangible to play with. So remember, the soul mm. itself is consciousness. How do you, we can't define what consciousness is. There's lots of definitions that are out there. But when we're talking about, like when we're when you and I are talking, or, or, or us here are talking, you're conscious of, like right now, you're conscious of my voice. And right. when you talk, I'm conscious of yours. But that's different in my model than consciousness, which I spell with all capital letters. Without a long, comprehensive explanation, what I call consciousness is God itself, not a religious God. This is beyond religion because it is consciousness for all that is conscious anywhere in the exa- in the entire universe or multiverse. So God is the source of consciousness itself, which in scientific terms would be the absolute, within which the relative exists as potential and possibility. So because we are relative expressions of the absolute, our nervous systems are monitoring three things, space, time, and movement. Those are the three coordinates that you have to have to be conscious of something. There has to be space for me to sit here and Justin to sit there, Sal to sit there, and Adam to sit there. Because we can't, physics physics says we can't put three bodies in the same space. You understand mm-hmm. that? We've tried. Yeah. We have to, have, and we do try. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, that was a bad joke. <laughs> we, 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 we have to have time because without time, there's no way to have a, um, a beginning, a middle, or an end. So there's no way to comprehend something unless, like, imagine if all sentences had the middle, beginning, and end on top of each other. Mm-hmm. You, there would not be nothing to comprehend. So, you know, watching a movie, you take something that's in a role, which is like, past, present, and future all balled up in a ball. Mm -hmm. You can't comprehend it. But if you run it through a movie strip in time, then you can comprehend it. So you have to have space because there's got to be a movie projected somewhere. You got to have time for it to unfold and movement is what allows time to exist in space. Mm -hmm. So those coordinates of consciousness allow us to be conscious of, but God is the sum total of all that is or ever will be. So God mathematically in my hypothesis that I teach my students is a zero. Mm. And zero only has two qualities. It's empty of everything. That's why we call it zero, yet it's the potential for everything. Or also known as infinity then, right? Well, infinity is different because you can have an infinity, like you can have an uh, an infinite number of beetle bugs, but not necessarily an infinite number of Earths that will contain them. So infinities are unique because they're specifically applied, but the absolute is the absolute. In other words, anything that can be conceived of or exist whatsoever is an expression within the absolute, Mm. and the absolute is beyond subject and object relationship. You can't get outside of it to measure it. So you can't be behind God. There is nothing mm. behind God. So does it live on after we die? Does your consciousness move? Does it, do we, uh, you pass, what happens to it? You mean you, your body does? Yeah, your, yeah your body does. Yeah, died. well, look, th- these are all very, uh, you know, metaphysical discussions and they're very uh, uh, debatable. Of course. I can only share what I know from a lot of investigations. Uh, you guys know that I 
do Tai Chi, Qi Gong, meditate. And I have lots of experience with uh, shamanic medicines and ceremonies and going deep, deep, deep as you can go. What I found out is that, uh, first of all, what we really are is, all, I mean, God means the source and sum of all things. So what God is cannot die or it wouldn't be God. I mean, it, because the, the cycle, what we call birth and death, is really like day and night. And both of those are expressions of something that's beyond the cycle, mm. right? It's in the cycle as its expression of itself, but it's beyond the cycle as its actual self, if that makes sense. Um, you know, for example, if you were to make a paper airplane right now, Sal, and throw it into the air, you would be the father of the paper airplane, and so there would be some of the paper airplane in it's you. It's a projected There's, expression of yeah, itself. There would be some of you in the paper airplane because you did it, you mm -hmm. you designed it, and, and therefore it carries your essence. God is beyond but within everything. But what God is as a zero, because a zero is no thing and everything, it's outside the laws of what we would call birth and death, yet paradoxically is the source of everything that can live and die. You know, God's not an easy thing for a small mind to understand because if you can't handle paradox, then you can never understand what God so, is. So, Paul, when you when you read a book like like the Bible, for instance, because I think some of the things that you talk about can almost be explained in there. Do you think what's wrong with it is is the religion of it of is Christianity, but the the overall message that was delivered in there is quite powerful and and and, and aligned with some of the, your views and how you think. Well, you know, the Bible, like any religious document, is a collection of stories about what was important to the people at the time it was written. There are also mythologies. I mean, look at the angels, look at the, you know, burning bush. I mean, the, the Bible is just loaded with mythological education, and myths are very important things. I mean, we've got to the point today where we think a myth is a lie, but that's a very, very uneducated expression of what myth is, uh, you know. Yeah, there's literal teaching you something. There's literal truth, and then there's you know there's uh, narrative truth, metaphorical, metaphorical truth, yeah. right? So to say something's not real, like they're missing the point. Yeah, you see, for if you study Houston Smith, who's the world's most highly regarded expert on world religion, he's the only man in the world that lived and practiced each religion daily and specifically for five years. So he went to each of the world's hmm. religion. And he devoted himself for five years to the practice of that religion and immersed himself in it. And Houston Smith says in his teachings that there's four levels of scriptural interpretation no matter what. Bible, Quran, Torah, uh, whatever, Patanjali Sutras, whatever you want to call a sacred text. The first level is literal interpretation. What is written is written as fact. Mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell says you should never see the Bible as or any spiritual teaching as a dictation, but a connotation. Mm. It connotes something. Mm -hmm. It is not written as actual fact. Right. So the, the lowest level of scriptural interpretation, which is the fundamentalist, is the literal interpretation. Mm -hmm. The next level is ethnocentric. It means it's about something about your group, but that always sets up a polarity. If Jesus isn't your chosen savior, you're going to burn in hell. Well, if you're Jewish, that's a criticism. If you're a Buddhist, they just feel sorry for you. If a Buddhist just hears that and says, well, you're still a child, you haven't figured it out yet. A Taoist says, you know, we'll be here waiting for you in the mountains when you wake up. You see my point? It's, it's, it's an ethnocentric orientation mm -hmm. and most mythologies are right the pueblo indians don't have the same um mythologies as the haida as the sioux as the navajo as the you know uh, right. inuits right so at that level that's how they perceive these things then you have level three which is allegorical what is an allegory tell me it's a teaching story mm -hmm. right if you watch uh, Batman and you're, if your kids watching Batman or Superman, aren't they always learning something sure. that has to do sure. with the real life they're living or about to live? That's an allegory, right? An allegory is a teaching story. Brer Rabbit. What do we know about Brer Rabbit? He said to the big 
the big bad wolf. Whatever you do, don't throw me in the briar patch. You can torture me. You can dip me in hot tar. No, just don't throw me in just there. Just don't throw me in the briar patch. So finally the wolf says, you know, that's, I just come to the realization that little rabbit does not want to be in that damn briar patch. So why don't I just do exactly that to his little bony ass? So what does he do? He throws him in the briar patch and the rabbit goes, <laughs> oh, you. this is where I was raised, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So it's a teaching story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you read the Bible and say, well, when people rape or pillage or steal or lie to God or whatever, it, this is what happens to them. You get your heads cut off, you end up in wars, the angels may or may not come help you. I mean, the Bible's just jacked up, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> there's something for everybody's mind in there for good or bad. And then the highest level is, are you ready for this? inspirational mm. so when you listen to someone like father thomas keating or thomas merton or um meister eckhart or uh, saint bernard or um saint hildegard of bingen these are christian mystics who told you the real truth in ways that can inspire you that we're often so far beyond the literalist interpretations. It was a joke, just like mm. Sufism is the mystical branch of Islam. So you've got people that, you know, believe what's written in the Quran is, is like ironclad and that's it, blah, blah, blah. But then you got the Sufis that not, they don't not use that, but they go way beyond it, mm -hmm. right? So you've got, for example, Christians that think if you don't take Jesus as your savior, you're going to burn in hell. Well, how, how does that show any, what kind of a God creates multiple races, multiple religions, and only puts Christianity basically in the West and then burns everybody else in hell that never had a clue about the man they call Jesus, who may have not even lived, there's not a shred of objective evidence that he lived, and research I've got in my library shows 368 parallels between the myth of Jesus and the myth of Krishna, which is a much more ancient Hindu mythology about their god. Mm. So you can see that the church borrowed a successful story and modified it. Now, doesn't that happen every day in the movies? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think it's, these are all in the religions. are I believe they're extremely important because they give people... I help they help give a moral people meaning, base. Yeah. moral base, and for humanity to survive, we all have to have this same objective morality to move forward. The subjective mm. rules that we kind of move forward, and the more successful a religion is, the bigger it tends to get, and the more successful the people become, and uh, and that's why I think you have a few major world religions, and you have a lot of smaller ones. Well, the the thing is, is there is some truth to what you just said, but I'm also going to flip the coin on you. First level of interpretation is literal. Well, we have a whole field called lawyers who manipulate the literal, don't they? Right. So look at all, there's 33,000 branches of Christianity that all claim to have the right interpretation of what Jesus mm. wants and God wants. Well, to me, that just means mass chaos. That means... We're confused as hell. Second, you have ethnocentric. It means my group, my religion says your religion's wrong. Well, good. The same book and store, stuff that you just talked about as good in religion also is the same source of wars because the number one cause of war in the world is religious differences. More people have died in religious battles than any other form of death. So we say, okay, well, if the literal interpretation is dangerous, the ethical or ethnocentric interpretation is dangerous because it pits my religion against yours. If you don't take Jesus as your savior, you're bad. If you're not one of us, you're an infidel, whatever it is, right? So it sets up this field of tensions that leads to a lot of death. So then you get to the allegorical. Now, only the wise people made it to the level of consciously be able to see things as an allegory, like a lot of people don't understand poetry or riddles, right? It mm. takes someone more evolved. And humanity at large is only now growing the ability that we would ascribe. If you look at how children's minds grow and develop, 
most people are really only at about uh, the level of a 12-year-old child in our culture, at least in the Western culture, and then there's a strata of people that are more evolved. In other words, a 12-year-old doesn't typically understand poetry. They can't think that abstractly. But 10 feet away from them, there's a 20-year-old that maybe understands it well, and there's a 40-year-old and a 60-year-old that understand it at much deeper levels than the 20-year-old. So the f higher you go in consciousness, Ken Wilber's got statistics on all this, like 65 to 70% of all the world's people are worshipers in fundamentalist religions, which is the first two levels, right. the, the absolute literal interpretation and the my group against your group interpretation. And that's why he was worried about Donald Trump getting voted. And he said, look, if these people swing the vote, we're in trouble because it's actually a lower level of consciousness. So they actually interpret the scriptures in ways that do lead to battles and lead to wars. Well, and Well, let me ask you this then. Let me ask you this point because, uh, you know, Carl Jung wrote about this in Undiscovered Self, how yeah. the loss of religion would would – cause the rise of other fundamental beliefs that are not based on religion, but rather based on things like communism or Marxism, which killed in the 20th century, mm -hmm. you know, by some estimates over a hundred, uh, you know, million people. And these are, these are atheistic, uh, you know, uh, movements, but they're religions in and of themselves. People yeah. that believe so much in communism that they're willing to uh, allow, you know, 50 million, you know, or 20 million Ukrainians die of starvations or whatever. Yeah. So, when you talk about Donald Trump and you talk about some of the fundamentals, fundamentalists that support him, what about the other side mm. that is like, not only do we not believe in that, but we believe that nothing exists. We're atheists. Right. Yeah. Do you, do you think that that, that also poses because, as much danger? Yeah. Because the way I look at it is there's always has to be something that is your, the top of your, your list of most important hierarchies Hierarchy, and everything yeah. you do moves you towards that. And if it's not God and you believe in no God and you think there is no God, then it's usually something of here, which is money, drugs, power, typically tends to be what it is. What do you think about that? Do you think that there's, there's when we're talking about religion in this way, do you think that there's also, we need to be careful for the people that move in the other direction and say there's nothing? Well, you know, the thing is, is there's a lot of ways to look at this. The, the people you're describing are technically called scientific materialists. Okay. That's the real name for them. So that's your... Uh, Richard Dawkins and your... Um, right, right. They know, would call themselves atheists, but I think I like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. well, there, there is atheism, but most of them fall into the camp of scientific material. They believe in science. That's their highest deity. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And if it can't be weighed or measured, then it doesn't exist. That's materialism, Okay. right? They believe that there was no consciousness before brains, but they forget a key fact. Brains are very late in the evolution of species. So you have to say if brains are re what is required to make consciousness, then how did every species on this planet get here to begin with? You see the point, mm -hmm. right? Brains, nervous systems didn't show up until the stage of evolution where creatures that we call jellyfish and that class of creatures were the first ones to have uh, nervous systems. That was a long, long, long time ago, but there was three billion years before that where the groundwork for the stage that ultimately led to brains. So you have to say, well, how do you get that level of complexity of creation that ultimately creates a brain as an end product with no consciousness if brains are the only source of consciousness? So really you see it's, it's kind of a self-destructive, <laughs> it's a self-defeating prophecy mm -hmm. because it's like saying, um, a watch can figure out its maker. Mm -hmm. If you're the watchmaker and the watch is made of steel and, and brass and glass, the mat scientific materialist viewpoint that brains are only conscious, there's only consciousness when you have a brain is like saying, well, somehow the matter, the atoms that make your brain up figured out how to make a brain, which mm -hmm. is like I've a watch that can yeah. figure out how its maker made it, which mm -hmm. is, is kind of... Uh, backwards in 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 flow now, be, besides that do you see though is there any because we, we you know we see what happens when people take religion and are fundamental and literal with it and ethocentric ethnocentric where they they, they go to war against each other they yeah. fight each other mm -hmm. but then we also see have seen in the 20th century where people don't believe in a, 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 a fundamental religion but they believe in something like communism or or fascism and that then kills 
lots of people in causes wars. Do you see danger in the in the in the movement that seems to be growing, which is the I don't believe that anything outside of what I can see kind of constructing exists. my own reality. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, one thing I want to share with you though um, that's profound. Carl Jung said in speaking of atheism, something must be real before it can be rejected. Therefore, atheism is actually a acknowledgement that God is real mm. because how can you deny something that doesn't exist? If there's no apple on the table, none of us denies that there's an apple on the table. <laughs> you see? Uh-huh. If, if there was no male, female, none of us would have the capacity to deny manhood or femininity because at first they have to exist. In other words, atheism is the rejection of something that you're making real because you can't reject something that isn't already real. You understand that point? Mm -hmm. So also there's a very interesting study I found a a while back years ago when I was looking into this and it showed a high, there was a very high correlation when they studied the psychological profiles of atheists and one of the, the high correlation with those that were atheists was a high relationship challenge with their father. So people that tended to become atheists had a high percentage of having had developmental problems with their dad. Their dad was mean, he was criticismal, he was abusive. And lo and behold, what is the Christian God? Well, he'll burn you in hell for touching your genitals, for mm-hmm. uh, worshiping on the wrong day. Uh, you know, the Old Testament God is a jealous God. I mean, the, the, the Bible's just chock full of, you know, nasty God attitudes. So when you have a religious God idea that is too parallel to your own experience of your father, do you see that the deeper uh, wound, the father-child wound, then recognizes its own projection of its father image into the Bible and says, I don't want anything to do with that because it reminds me too much of the pain. Mm -hmm. And that's how we protect ourselves. That's The shadow is full of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We repress, we deny, we develop soul loss, and that part of us is forever looking for the You know, the, the, like when you're raised by an abusive father, part of you spends the rest of its life on red alert looking for any man that talks like, looks like, moves like, acts like, or smells like that person. And it'll light you up like a Christmas tree inside. And you may act very irrationally to that person and not even know why you're doing it because they triggered what Jung called a complex, a neurally charged network of associations that carries everything from colors to smells to words. So atheism, according to the research I saw, is often actually the byproduct of a rejection of the father image. Hmm. And it is carried over into a religion that's heavy on on father archetype. God is the father in the sky. Hmm. I mean, just to show you how unusual it is, really, if you look at it logically, we know men don't give birth to things. It has to be a woman. Yet Christianity says that that God is a father and that the father gave birth to the universe. But the reality of it is if you go far enough back into Gnosticism and some of the very earlier uh, religions that led like to the Christianity. Druids and all that. Yeah, they were all um, matriarchal. They, they saw God as a woman. Then if you look at the research, you see that periodically, every su- f- several thousand years, I think it's 4,000 years, if I remember right, we tend, humanity twins, tends to switch from a matriarchal dominant belief system to a patriarchal. So we're just, I believe we're now just petering out. We're just now mm. seeing the kind of male dominant themes start to frazzle and break down. And that's what the women are saying. I've had enough of this male leadership. It's got to go. And which is what led to our conversations mm. earlier. But uh, there's another point I want to bring up, Sal, and that is this. A lot of the things you're referring to, like Marxism and whatever, Mm -hmm. those are not religions. They're not, but people treat them. Yes. So there's a deeper meaning. The word religion comes from the root word religio, which means to yoke to or to union. So the practice of religion is to link to or create reunion with the rest of yourself, which is inclusive of all life, right? So someone truly practicing religion truly practicing religion does not go to war against people with different viewpoints they try to have empathy compassion and talk to them 
I mean, Jesus said, if someone hits you, turn the other cheek. He didn't say <laughs> chop their head off and rape their wife, which the Christians did a lot of, called the Crusades. Um, so if a practice is not teaching you how to better love and understand, have empathy, and do your best to get along with people, then it's not a religion. It's a cult right. or it's just some other belief system. Right. And with with the that this movement of just, you know, uh, the scientific uh, materialism, you get moral relativism many times yes. where, yeah. oh, what you're doing is okay as long as you're okay with it. And what you think, what's good for you is fine. What's good for me is, you know, something else. And there's no objective moral base many times. And so you get, it can be dangerous. Well, it can be the, quite dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason for that too. <laughs> Let me ask you guys a question. What is immoral? Define immoral for me. Right, right. Well, for, for me, what I would believe to be immoral probably is comes from the, the Christian Judeo religion, if I were to give it roots, but that would be... The difference between right and wrong. Yeah, don't hurt someone, don't steal from someone, um, you know, don't, uh, don't lie, you know, those types of things. Basic human rights. As yeah. much as I love you, I'm going to have to educate you. Okay, bring it. Those are, <laughs> those are virtues. Okay. Those are not morals. This is why I'm asking you the question to show you that you guys are much more intelligent than most people on this planet. And you're having a discussion right now about morals without a clear distinction being made. And this is what gets people confused. And this is exactly why these problems happen. A moral is a code of conduct that is life affirmative. A virtue is a code of conduct that may be a relationship affirmative or positive in your uh, religion or in your culture or in your society. Like there's a lot of things that we think of as polite. Like if you put your hand so on So we're a, striving to be what we're not so, actually achieving. So, it's, so moral, morality is not right or wrong then? No. Uh, well, sort of. What I'm okay. saying is virtues are the things that we call doing good. But what you do to do good here is different than what you do in the Middle East than, than right. uh, in Iceland. And you see these cultural differences, like I was about to say. In some cultures, like I believe it's the African culture, putting your hand on someone's head is is disgusting. Mm -hmm. There's some cultures that don't like that at all. That's, you know, don't get that close to me. It's like a sign of contempt, isn't it? Yeah, I can't remember. It has to do with, the, I think, the soul leaves through the head or something. I don't remember the background yeah. on it. But in, in our culture, if a, especially a strong male puts his hand on your head, it's as though he's acknowledging you, good boy. I'm only making the point that what we think of as right is only right within the context of our own programming, our own social and cultural framework. Sure. Mm. But a moral is a but code don't we of have conduct. to build off of that? Yeah, but we're going backwards okay. to morals because that's what we have to build on. A right. moral is a code of conduct that is life affirmative. When I was a soldier in the 82nd Airborne Division, I had a soldier's manual. It said who to kill and who not to kill. That is not a moral code. It is an ethical code. Ethics can be group specific, can be um, religion specific. In other words, uh, if you work for UPS, there could be different ethics than if you work for FedEx, sure. right? So, but morals, let's look at what are some of the things that we have to understand as morals if we're going to survive and then another 50 years on this planet. Do we have to agree that taking care of the soil is critical? Sure. How far can we go chemically poisoning the soil? Well, wouldn't that be... Not very far. Wouldn't that be, though, like me, if I say don't hurt anybody, wouldn't that also be immoral? I mean, if we all hurt each other, we uh, wouldn't survive either. That's technically immoral be okay. because you're uh, diminishing the chances of life if you believe that everybody's here is as a unique contributor so you're to the saying world. morals contribute to life morals contribute to the sustenance of survivability of life itself would so, it would it be moral then to procreate it, it would be moral to procreate unless procreation was actually decreasing your chances of survival like okay. right now we're at a tipping point we're consuming the planet and its resources at a far faster pace than the planet can regenerate it so the more we have kids right now the more potentially immoral it is because once you cross the tipping point, the quality of life for each child born gets to be less and less. Mm. Do you see, can you project that into the future? 
Like in other words, if we're already uh, running out of resources, look, there's hardly any clean water left, drinkable water. Only one to two percent of the water in the world is drinkable. About 99.9 percent of it is now heavily poisoned with toxins, killing fish off, causing sex changes in in fish and other animals, and the long, long list of things. So then, well, from that from that standpoint, you could then you could argue that it's morally correct or right for some sort of a world leader that would not allow us to have more than one or two children or sterilize or if you see that's true but in my opinion the first prerogative of that decision would you would be you would have to effectively educate people because if they weren't able to understand why that was happening the, why, why would they want to repress their sex urge, which is much stronger than the ego sense of self-control? I mean, how many times have you guys had sex when you knew you probably shouldn't? Yeah. Right? Couple. There's a, uh, <laughs> couple. At, at least two times. <laughs> a few, few times. There's a thing. <laughs> Maybe say, twice. There's a saying, the stiff cock has no consciousness, right? It just, oh. go, go, go. <laughs> uh, but that's a bumper sticker <laughs> stiff cock yeah. but do, but do, yeah. but do you do you, I, you know what i think it is i think it's I, very complex is what it is it is but i i think we're not high enough yet. i think yeah. people <laughs> if for for things to progress and move forward one of the key elements is that people have to voluntarily hmm. want to do so they you know, adam, do. adam mentioned sterilization or whatever yeah it wouldn't work if everybody was forced but if everybody decided hey we should probably not have as many kids or whatever totally different. So it goes back to what I said, education. If you can give people good data to say, look, this is how much water we have. This is how much farmable land we have. This is how much food we can produce a year. And this is how many people we can feed. If you look at what it takes, we have to have air to breathe. And the uh, I could sit here and give you the statistics on air. Like we've got cities in the world where the volume of oxygen now is is low enough that old people just start dying off. You got Mexico City, you got places like Denver, where the you know it wasn't that long ago we had twenty two percent oxygen in the atmosphere. Now it's in some places down as low as seventeen, heading for sixteen, and I can't remember how low. But we can't go too much lower, and human life can't exist because the oxygen saturation isn't high enough. So. We've got pollution levels that are high enough in some places it's killing people off and we are poisoning the environment. I mean, uh, look, there's a reason we had to go to unleaded gas. I, I, I used to live in Los Angeles when you could drive into we Los just, Angeles. I just learned about this. Yeah, Michael we, Wood. Yes, I had never heard of this where you're, where you're going right now. Yeah, but, well, we, we, I used to drive into Los Angeles from San Diego and you could see a dome of smog that was like, like somebody had – exploded a pile of red brick you know that red like sedona arizona right. dust it would be like you would drive into this cloud and you, your depth perception your depth changes because it was like 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 it was like you were in a room full of dust i would wheeze my father used to tell me that radiator hoses in Los Angeles would only last about two years before the rubber would completely crumble and just rot off the car's engine two or three years. Tires would rot, right? So they had to start cleaning. This was causing emphysema, was causing huge amounts of death. And this was right. So one of the things that was doing it is lead and gasoline. So they had to switch to unleaded. The point that I'm making is if you look at the statistics, statistics right now show it's 10 times safer to breathe the air outside of any building than it is inside the building because of the chemicals. But really, what am I saying? I'm just trying to outline a few things. We have to have water. We have to have food. We have to have warmth. We have to have the ability to heat our homes and, and we have to have shelter. We, there's certain criteria that humans have to have in order to live effectively. And the bigger the number of people you get, the more of a challenge it is to meet those criteria. So if you study the history of tribal societies, they found, for example, if a tribe got bigger than about 55 people, they needed to gather more resources than they could traveling around on foot. There wasn't enough bear or deer or elk to kill. They would, you see what I'm pointing? At some point, at some point, it, it's a fact that our resources uh, is limited. It's a fact. However, there's, there's what, how many billions of people on earth now? Almost seven, I think. Almost seven billion people. And we have, we're producing more food 
uh, than we ever have in all of human history, more than we in some places that we need. And I'm not not to argue with what you're saying. Yeah. I think what happened, I think what humans were really good at figuring out problems, but we prioritize problems. And problem mm. number one was shelter, food, yeah, basic survival ba- needs. And, and not, they're not worrying about pollution. They're not like if you go to a third world country where they just started getting you know, carbon fuels and they started getting machinery to do work for them and you tell them, no, we're polluting the earth. Yeah. They don't care about that because they're like, look, last week I wasn't able to feed my kids. Yeah, well, there's a and, different level of conscious development. Yeah, and, I, th- and, and I, think, I think you're right. I think we're reaching a level now where we're, we're able to achieve what we can achieve and now we have the ability to look and look further out rather than just the immediate because we have enough food. We have more food than we need in, 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 uh, in, in many places now we can look further out and say, because we see it now with, you know, we have sponsors that sponsor our show. And one of our sponsors is a, an online, like organic food uh, market, uh, Thrive Market. Yeah. And one of the things that they talk about, one of their selling points is that they give away a free membership to a family in need uh, when you get a membership. Yeah. That wasn't a selling point in marketing before. And the reason was because I don't think before people could look past the fact that I just need food. Now we have enough. We now, if you buy a product or do something, it has to also do something good for the earth or do something good for humanity aside from the fact that they're just providing you a service. So I think we're reaching that point now where people are starting to talk a lot about what you're saying because now we're, you know, we have some of these basic needs. Let me, needs let met. me take you back a, a step because I'm going to use something you just said to make a point. Yes, we do have food, but we don't have food that's healthy. Look at all the diseases we have and look how much of it's tracked right back to food. We have calories. We have calories (laughs) without nutrition, which comes at the cost of the destruction of the planet, which is the very thing we're talking about with morality. Mm. Okay, now let's get deeper into morality. We do have lots of food, but we have almost 2 billion people that don't have clean water to drink or food to eat. Is it moral... For us to have people rich enough that their annual income would feed potentially hundreds of thousands of some of these people. Do you see my point? The United States itself is one of the most massive consumers and junk producers. We poison the globe at a rate that sometimes as many as 150 or 160 other countries don't even match up to. So if, if we look at morality and we agree that all human beings and all species on earth deserve the right to be citizens of the earth, do you see that it's immoral the way we are consuming and destroying the planet and raping and pillaging it because the very guy you talked about, the native mm-hmm. that's out there with his hoe, and I've got videos in my library from the shaman of native tribes and the chiefs of native tribes that were sent through people like BBC television showing how the vegetation on the top of the mountains is all dying out and they're tracking it to chemicals and environmental changes and they say the white man is is shortening the life of the earth itself and that we may all die. If you look at the Hopi prophecies, they predicted we were at a crossroads. We were going to get to a crossroad and they have a diagram caught into a rock. If man takes the low road and gets back to farming and being close to the earth, remember in the Bible it says... The meek shall inherit the earth, (laughs) not the wealthy, not the rich, not the powerful, the meek. And the Hopi diagram says you go this way and you get closer to the earth and simplify it. If you take the high road, which leads to rockets and advanced technology, the trail just comes to a dead end. It just stops. And that that represents the end of life Mm. as we know it. Like, so it's been prophesied over and over again, many, many of the world religions. So do you see when what happens if we don't all get clear on what is immoral and how important are morals relative to ethics? Because most religious doctrines actually turn out to be ethical, not moral. And I researched who were the top 100 polluting countries in the world, or companies in the world, and then who owned them. And I found research showing that Nine, I think I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, it was like nine out of 10 of the people on the boards of the directors of the most destructive countries in the world are claimed to be Christians. So we have religious ideology that is got beliefs about, for example, most people that 
believe some form of Christianity think that this is just a place you go to on the way to heaven. It's like a, a, a stopover station. So who gives a shit? When Jesus comes, we're all going to be raised from the dead and anybody that's taken Jesus is going to heaven. So the earth, they don't really have that much compassion for the earth. It's, it's not in their philosophy. But if you study other, many of the other more native philosophies and philosophies around the world or religions around the world, taking care of the earth is inherent. Yogananda taught the importance of gardening and the importance of caring for the earth, for example, and I was my parents became. I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put place it at the feet of uh, Christianity. I think that's a human. I mean, well, it's not just Christianity, yeah. but I'm making a point. The point I'm making is the difference between an ethic and a moral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm saying that what most religions operate on is ethics, which is group oriented. Yeah. I don't think when they when those religions were, I mean, they couldn't have foreseen uh, some of the challenges that we would encounter today. Well, that's part of the problem yeah. because most of the religions are really collections of myths and myths are based on what your belief of the powers are that you can't understand, such as gods of lightning and gods of thunder. Mm. Before science, they, they thought those were real mm. beings, right? And they may still be, we don't know. But the point is the mythology is always basically based on the interpretation of the wise elders of the time, as wise as they can be. But here we are 2,000 and something years, Twenty. this is 2018, like Jesus was a long time ago. And so the, and the Old Testament's even older than that. So if you're reading the Bible today, you're reading a mythological document that's very out of context with iPhones. Um, 33,000 branches of Christianity that all think they're right, uh, jet aircraft, uh, chemical farming, uh, electronic tattoos. I mean, look at what we live in. I, I, mean, I wonder if you followed, though, the te- if you followed some of the th- things the way you were supposed to. Like, I look around in this room, and I don't think any of us consider ourselves to be you know, greedy consumers, but I have more than one pair of shoes. I don't need more than one pair. It's relative. Have, right, right. And and so I think if we, I think the problem is this, just this inherent thing that humans tend to have where we want to consume and, and, and consume and consume and have way more than we need. I mean, all of us in this room have, I think, way more than we need. But yes. It, well, I, we could, we could argue back way, if we go way, way back when, when it was incredibly hard to hunt and kill and find something. If you came across a, let's just say, you know, hypothetically, that the average tribe that would go out to hunt in a day would kill one or two animals. That was just, let's just say for argument's sake. Yeah. But you came across 10 or 15 and you had the opportunity to kill all of them, you would. You might. If you go back far enough, you know, they did mass uh, extinctions, like they would take buffalo off a cliff. <laughs> You know, and they'd kill as many as they could, yeah. and then they'd just distribute the meat as far and wide as they could yeah. amongst whoever they could share it with because it's far less risky to mm-hmm. face buffalo in a mass attack like that than have to go at one with a spear because they can kill you, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's some, some, some deeper issues here, and the deeper issues are... I'm going to go back to you, Sal. Yes, we all in this room live, compared to most people in the world, a very privileged life. But I have a question for each of you. If there was a way you could easily give money that you could trust would reliably put water in the life and food in the life of someone that really needed it, not some freaking scam like mm-hmm. we see, like, you know, the, oh, yeah. the, the American <laughs> Cancer Association at the freaking airport ringing a bell when they're already, like, loaded up with billions of dollars that they're getting from corporations to sell bogus freaking ideas. Another long story. But anyhow, wouldn't each of you be happy to donate? If, the, if you could... I think about that all the sure. time. And it, one of the things that I try to think about is... What's the most effective possible thing that I could do? And first thing I could do is become a better human myself. That's number one, because it's the easiest thing to change. Yeah. And the second thing, so far from my study that I've seen, there's one, and humans are never perfect, which is not. That's why they say, you know, I'm only human. But the one thing that I've ever seen that has, or the one thing that I've seen that has lifted more people out of poverty, fed more people, and housed more people successfully, better than anything else, it's still not perfect, is just free Education. markets. Uh-huh. Just free markets. Let people freely trade and benefit from that trade and work with each other because that's what people tend to do when you let people be free. Yeah. 
And I mean, you look at a country like Hong Kong, which went from third world country to one of the wealthiest countries in the world in less than 50 years. I mean, this is what happens. And so that's what I always think. And I think, okay, yes, I could give somebody $100, but what if I could, you know, maybe influence in a way my audience or whatever to where where they're at becomes more free, allows them to lift themselves out of poverty. Well, that's the secret. You know, Abraham Lincoln said the best thing you can do to help the poor is not to become one of them. Mm. Right. And mm. what he, a lot of people took that wrong. What he mm. means is they need example. They need leadership. Yeah. They don't need company. You know, if you keep giving money to people that don't know how to manage money, that it's like giving money to a drug addict. Right. Trust mm -hmm. me. I know I was raised with a drug addict as a brother who would consume money as fast as you could come up with it and You're always helping them. had the same excuses yeah. and never used it to eat or anything. But but the key point that I'm making is there is natural moral instinct in human beings, I believe, unless they're abused as children and lose touch with their morality, like a psychopath, you know, killers. But but all of us, I don't think any of us, if we were to able to look at a live feed of video from Haiti or some of these countries in the world where kids are just bloated up with a, a, a flies eating their eyes, haven't eaten a meal in days, are picking worms out of the soil, mothers having to walk as far as 30, 40, and 50 kilometers to get a bucket of water to try to make rice or do anything for their kids. I mean, if any one of us could push a button and send some money to feed that kid or to, to put some kind of shelter together, I think all of us would inherently do it. But we have, one, we have an ethnocentric corporate structure, meaning a my group structure, my group against your group. So the problem with the free trade is that you get this rank and order, as Jordan Peterson talks about. It's a natural thing that happens. You you go into a, a, a tribe of gorillas. There's a silverback. It's a hierarchy. If you want to take him out, you got to take him out, yeah. and you might get killed doing it. So don't just. But you, you want to take out Mac, you got to be, you know, Bill Gates to do it, uh, and then you still got to work at it. But you see, there's this hierarchy. What I'm pointing to is that we see the stratification of resources. We see this ter territorialization. We territorize things. This is my territory. You look at the medical profession. Chiropractors aren't allowed to do this. Physical therapists can only do this and you can't do that. This doctor only operates there but not there. We, we see this as like human – It because all it goes down all the, to marking our territory. A dog pisses on trees for a reason, right? A bear scratches trees to let you know – you're in my grounds. <laughs> if you're hunting in my grounds, you're going to deal with me. But we're, we're, hopefully we're at the point now we can realize we all need each other. It's hard for me to sit and be happy while I know that millions of people are dying around the world because nobody's reaching out to help them while we have enough food. And even if we don't have great food, if we sent bologna over there, it's better than nothing, mm -hmm. right? If we sent... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, Cheerios that have high glyphosate residues. It's not the way I'd want to go, but I'm saying it's yeah. still going to keep them alive and give them more joy than starving. And I'm saying that we have enough, if we shipped our leftovers and our junk to them, it'd be a massive increase. It's a distribution But uh, we challenge. don't. Yeah. It's not just a distribution. We have the powers to distribute. It's a. It has to do with belief system. Sure. It has to do with power. It has to do with control. It has to do with who is in your tribe, right? If a bunch of people were over in the Middle East and got taken prisoner and they were from your church, I wouldn't doubt if a bunch of church members would get together and hire a band of ex-Navy SEALs to go extract them. But when we reach the level of consciousness where we realize everybody in the world that's not getting the necessary means to support life or moral treatment is a part of ourselves... Then we reach the part where we're going beyond ethnocentric and we're becoming world-centric in our consciousness. And we've got enough problems in the world now, big problems, whether it be water, whether it be soil, whether it be pollution, whether it be the dangers of advanced science, whether it be nuclear problems, whether it be the problems of a potential third world war with nuclear weapons, which would destroy the planet. I mean, the list of them is long. We now have enough challenges facing the world that any one of us could destroy the other and we also have enough technology 
and transport to support each other and enough information technology to talk to each other that now is the time that we need to become citizens of the world and get rid of all the uh, pissing on trees and, and, and mine versus yours. And we, we, we either are going to grow into it or we're going to take us into a level of catastrophe that requires all hands on deck regardless of race, creed, color, and skin or none of us is going to make it. Do you, do you, when you, when you're at home and you're thinking like this, do you get really down? Or do you, what do you think about to bring yourself up? Well, I think about how many times I've been merged with God and saw that mm. God is God is the, loves this, you know. God is I'll give you an analogy. God is like a, a genius little boy that loves to make games and then makes an agreement with himself or itself. God says, "Okay, now that you've made the game, You've got to jump inside and beat the game to get out, to figure out that it was you that made the game. So we're all God wearing egos or masks at the party, pretending that we don't realize who we really are. And the game is, can you survive the feeling of being separate from the rest of yourself, the rest of God? And so we use this thing called love to constantly remind us what it feels like to be more whole. Like when I get a hug from any one of you, a piece of me is accepting me and I'm accepting another piece of me and I feel more, I feel more safe. I've been told I'm a good hugger. There's more <laughs> of me and there's more of me. Do you, you feel that? Absolutely. Like, there's more love. There's more safety in the world. That's why children need to be loved and hugged. So when, when you go to parties, do, do, are you able to have surface conversation or is it always <laughs> like, if you know, you know, you must hate yeah. that, right? When you're at a party, hey, you know, well, how's you know, the weather? You got to get bored. Like, yeah, are you fast, like, no, yeah. we're going deep as fuck. What's your golf game but uh, just, these days? Yeah, fuck. <laughs> are you kidding me? Uh, just, just to finish my point though, like I've had so many potent powerful union experiences where i see god loves it all god loves the strife god loves the fear god's so committed to wearing the mask that i mean god is the actor that is so good you don't know that god's acting right isn't that what we call good acting like haven't you ever watched somebody in a role in a movie and been blown away yeah, yeah. and then watched them in like the opposite role in another movie and went oh my god i can't believe that guy is that that Same. actor yeah. mm -hmm. he was the bad guy last time he was amazing and now he's this mushy gay guy or something you're like how the <laughs> fuck does he do that god is that crazy and god loves to create and to explore and, and god can't know god without this right just because you're omnipotent all knowing i mean omniscient all knowing doesn't mean you have all experience. We are giving God the experience of what it's like. There's only one Sal. There's only one Justin. There's only one Adam. There's only one Doug. There's only one Eli. There's only one... Taylor. Caleb? Is that Taylor back there? Taylor. Taylor there's, yeah. only one, there's only one Paul Check, right? Do you realize there will be never another person in the universe to wear those fingerprints? God is a novelty generator. God will not make another Sal. You are the one and only. So the question is, will you be happy with you when you die? Will you say, I loved it. I did the best Sal I could do, man. And as long as you're happy, God's happy. And the thing is, because there's no one to compare any of us to, how, do you, how can you say whether you did a good or a bad job? You get, you get my point? So God... God doesn't die. God says, oh my God, that was fun. What are we going to do next? <laughs> <laughs> but the point though, the deeper point is if someone punches Sal in the mouth, it hurts. If someone punches Paul in the mouth, it hurts. If, if someone steals our money, it hurts. I mean, when someone broke into my house and stole my computer and my big screen and smashed my door in and cost me $10,000, I was right pissed off. <laughs> I know that was God doing that. But I said, God damn it. <laughs> I don't like this part of the game. Right? So you really get into the game, right? A saint is someone who can rise above the game. This is why Buddha said, if you want to stay off the wheel of samsara, if you don't want to keep getting waking up in a play, 
you got to stop desiring objects. Desire life, desire love, but stop desiring objects. Right, embrace that experience, right? Embrace the experience, but learn to detach mm. from objects. Mm. So do you see that because time is not relevant to God, I mean, what, what the time? How much time does God have? All of it. Yeah. <laughs> how much is it? Eternal. How many games can you play? As many as you want. As many as you want. Uh, All of them, forever. But what I'm saying is inside the game, there's people starving. There's people dying. There's people being tortured. There's children that are sexually abused, physically abused, and emotionally abused. There's religious figures. We know Catholicism has a real problem with sexual abuse in the church. And we know that all religions have their problems. We know that there's uh, genocide. I mean, the world's... Let's just say it. It's got some fucking problems. But that's inherently part of the game. And it says right in the Bible. I've quoted it before on your show, Isaiah 45, 7. I create the light and the dark. I create good and evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And they don't want to look at that. That's God saying, this is the story. Who do you want to be? And remember, for you to be anybody, there has to be somebody relatively opposed to you or you can't stick out. You get my point? Mm -hmm. If everybody agreed with you on everything, then there wouldn't be consciousness because there would be no polarity to differentiate something. To be conscious of a color, you have to have another color juxtaposed to it. You follow me? If everything was white, then you said, "How? what do you think about a green something? You'd say, what's that? You'd have no correlation. But because you got white and green or black and white, we have consciousness. Consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. Good and evil, love, hate, or love, indifference. You, you see- they have the, to, you, you can't have one without the other. That's the basic working polarities that the artist we call God uses to paint and animate life itself. So if we don't understand that the spiritual path is to learn to work with those powers with morality so that everybody gets to play the game. Everybody gets to, to win, lose, and come home and have a meal. Everybody gets to make love and still not worry about whether they're going to have a roof over their head. We have enough money and enough resources for everyone to meet the moral basics of life, but we're not doing it. Why? Because we're still at a lower level of consciousness, which is ethnocentric, mm -hmm. below which is that fundamental, it's the words on the page. It's time for us to at least get the allegory, right? And get inspirational about it. I mean, isn't that what you guys are all about? That's what we, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we try to do. Yeah, well, absolutely. there you go. So you see, it's all alive at once, mm -hmm. but it takes people that are conscious enough to have climbed up in their own evolution to say, you know, once I used to behave like that, but now I can see... I was forgetting about the rest of God or the rest of people or the rest of the world or I was denying some person with a different color skin or someone who has less money than me or I was judging someone who's living out of a shopping cart and, 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 and pretending they were less God or less spiritual or less anything than me. What do, you, what do you think about people that extend that type of empathy towards animals to the point where they say i don't want to ever eat or kill an animal because you know they're they're part of life just like i am really. um i'm i say that to the do, degree that you can do that without being abusive to the animal that your body is then you're being a moral person mm. but the day that you stop eating animals and killing animals and you get to the point where you can no longer contribute to society and be an active member in society and be a human being because remember cows don't vote cows uh, can't stop uh drilling in the ocean and fracking and cows can't stop nuclear warfare but if you eat a cow and it gives you the sustenance and the ability to contribute at a level of consciousness in the world that the world needs then the cow First of all, in my philosophy, the cow didn't die. It just became you. Can you live without food? Nope. You are what you eat. 
Doctor diet, build your temple of body <laughs> yeah, for yeah. your mind. We raise and eat our food with love. It makes our chemistry. Add good water and a smile. Be filled with energy. Eat good organics and be wise. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. Yum yum. Did yeah. you write that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's your. <laughs> wow, that was beautiful. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change. I'm gonna change gears or, or, or directions with you, Paul. I want to ask you. You you told us you're just you're you're about to start a podcast. Yeah. What made you decide to get into that space? What made you decide to start podcasting? Um. Well, I was spending a huge amount of time. I you know I put a blog up basically every week. When I first started doing it, I was putting up as many as three a week, and it was taking me anywhere from 40 minutes to two hours to produce one. And I've seen the, t- the trends because I've talked to experts in this, you know, and they say people are watching less and less video and podcasts are becoming much more popular. And the video uh, attention span is getting shorter and shorter, but the audio attention span is getting longer and longer. Yeah, yeah. that's true. And it's you guys know I'm not a fast food educator, yeah. man. I'm not the short You're not going to get sound dude. bites. We've tried. I've, I, I don't have a sound bite genome, man. I'm like, <laughs> I'm fucking, let's talk about this in enough depth that when you walk out of here, there's a chance you could be somebody else. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but this, like, how to fix the world in 10 minute bullshit, like Western fluffy spirituality, take this pill, read this book, and you'll be a fucking Buddha. That's all horseshit. <laughs> but, uh, um, so you felt podcasting was the perfect well, medium for you. One, I agree. I got lots and lots of people requesting me to do a podcast. They say, Paul, we would love to listen to your opinions on things. That's why we listen to all these podcasts. We, you have a holistic opinion. We're interested. Why do you keep doing podcasts and having other people ask you questions? Why don't you ask the questions? Or better yet, just tell us what your opinions and then they leave me a long laundry one guy wrote me like a hundred things he wanted me to talk about i'm like holy <laughs> shit this guy forgets Get i have to pay out, bills man. you know <laughs> but uh uh w- with the attention span and and the time spent watching videos going down and the long form audio becoming pop it makes my life easier mm-hmm. i've all i've got over 150 podcast concepts written down in a notebook just in the last couple of months just As they come to my head, just write it down. And I've had so much fun. Like you guys were the first big podcasters to bring me on. And that kind of kicked off lots of things. And and I'm like... These guys are having so goddamn much fun doing this. <laughs> it is fun. It's a blast. I'm like, wh- why am I working so hard to try to help the world? I could just hang out with Mind Pump all yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. We'll change the world together. You know, is <laughs> but so. It, and, and since, as we talked about, the more podcasts I do, the better, the more students we get at the Institute, because people understand. I'm just, you know, I'm not saying I have the answer to all these questions. I'm saying, but, I, but I'm at least honest enough to think about them and put my heart and soul and say, what can I do for the world every day? Mm-hmm. What's the best thing I can do to feed somebody who's starving in Africa? Well, the best thing I can do is the best thing that I can do. And that is share the wisdom that I have about what life is, what religion really is, what love really is. And how important it is to feed yourself and not starve yourself and claim you're a vegetarian. Mm. And next thing you know, you're completely exhausted because you've gone to gluconeogenesis to eat your own muscle, to run your own brain chemistry and hormonal system. And you're telling me that you don't want to harm animals, but you're harming the only Mm. animal that can actually make big changes in the world. That's not really a very spiritually evolved philosophy. You closed that loop real nice right there. Yeah. So that's the point though, you (laughs) see, because- if we're damaging ourselves to try to save an animal that can't contribute effectively to the world because we are its shepherd, you understand the concept, Mm -hmm. then we are actually devolving. I'm all for eating as little meat as possible. I don't like to kill things either. I'm best friends with my plants. I pet spiders. I love the rattlesnakes. I, I love it all. But I also know how the great chain of being works. I mean, I watch the rattlesnakes eating and I watched the rattlesnake eats the rat and the hawk eats the rattlesnake and I've watched roadrunners eat rattlesnakes. I mean, I live out in the wild, so I get to see this going on all around me. Everything's eating something else. That's just how it's built. Mm -hmm. And it's all God eating God. There is nothing else. That's what the Ouroboros means, the snake eating its tail. Mm -hmm. God has nothing to eat but God. So the question is, what do you need to feed yourself in order to be a viable contributor to your own dream because the more love you're making, the more love you're adding to the world. Isn't that true? Mm. And if you're healthy and you can 
engage the challenges of life and grow, then you're being a good example for the rest of the world. And as you grow in conscious, you then you really, the questions of the world become natural for you. So it is very moral to take care of yourself. It's and if extremely you're not, yeah, moral. Because then you can't do anything. It's you can't the help basis anyone. of morality. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. It's the basis of morality. Right. But taking care of yourself, paradoxically, can't be done without taking care of everybody else. Because if we don't spend any money on organic food, how do the organic farmers take care of their kids right, right. and teach them to farm? How do they buy clothes, right? So ultimately, at the end of the day, what I tell people, you have to be very conscious of what you spend your money on because that's the only vote that matters today. I mean, I don't know if Absolutely. you realize, it doesn't matter what direction you go with politics anymore, you're screwed. That's right. Yeah. You, you end got, up with the same, two sides you, of the you same You got point. shit right. on shit. <laughs> right? What was it, South Park? Were they voting for a turd sandwich or a douche? <laughs> or yeah. douchey McDouche. Yeah. Like that. I mean, so, so the vote is really our wallet. Are we supporting people that are taking care of the earth? Are we funding educational systems that actually work? That's why I've got my kid in the Steiner school. Steiner's education system, in my opinion, after lots of research, is hands down the best in the world. There's no competition. It's expensive, though. So if nobody spends money to put their kids in a Steiner school, then nobody can pay Steiner's teachers, and then the Steiner school right. system ceases to exist. Right. So the morality really says it's not like you got to go do all the weeding and the organic farming yourself. You don't even have to go build the shelters for the kids that are starving. You just have to say, where do I want to direct my money? I always tell people mm-hmm. this. I say, mm-hmm. if you want... If you want more of something in the world, put your money towards it. So yes. whatever you spend, if yep. you're upset that there's a liquor store at every corner, don't give them any money. If right. you don't like magazines with you know celebrities on them promoting bullshit, you know nutrition or whatever, quit buying them. Don't. Yeah, that's it. Vote with your dollars. Most powerful thing we could possibly do because I think you're absolutely right. The the act the elections don't really mean no that much. Yeah. We're voting all the time. Right. We're voting by the way we act with each other. Right. If you're acting like someone's in your hood and that's your territory, like a gangster, you're already voting. You're you're not you're it doesn't matter who you vote for president. You already are doing exactly what Donald Trump's doing, segregating everybody from everybody else. But let me tell you something. I'm not kidding. If you look at the problems of the world right now, it's got to be all hands on deck. We really have to say, what do you need? Because. We got to keep you going because we need this from you. We all have things each other needs. If Mm -hmm. you just look, Russia has things we need. Australia has things we need. We have things they need. And the reality of it is, without going into a bunch of doomsday stuff, if you look at a lot of the projections from various fields, whether it be (laughs) volcanoes that are due to go off, whether it be solar activity from the sun that could potentially wipe us out. I mean, there's a lot of shit going down. Yeah. I don't think you need to be that smart to figure out. It's time for us to start holding hands together well, and the, say, the we good, got bigger problems than our fucking egos coming our way. Well, the good news is now we have the technology for information to spread fast and cheap. Yeah. So now, like, you could record a podcast... And you could reach theoretically mm-hmm. an inf- I mean, all, everyone, mm-hmm. and the barrier to Which enter is that. Planting seeds. Everywhere. Yeah, it's very little. Where you could write a book, it might cost money. Someone yeah. could listen to a podcast, it costs even less yeah. money. Yeah. And you can get it out more. So I'm glad you're doing it. Well, I'm glad I'm doing it too, and I'm and I'm also thankful to you guys because honestly, you guys were the first people that really uh, kind of gave me a hard on on this thing. You know, mm. it's like mm, we gave you. A- <laughs> hey, you got my Woody up. Adam does that a lot. <laughs> Well, the first thing I noticed is you guys were having a fucking good time. I said, these fucking guys, these young guys, man, they got the world right by the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> They're having fun. They're making the money. Yeah. You know, they're enjoying Do you life. remember what you said to us when we laughed that day? And it's so fucking weird because, okay, because you definitely come across as, uh, you can come across sometimes as like this person who like a, foresees the future. And some people might think that's a little weird and some... There's something you said to us that day oh, that yeah. is so fucking weird uh-huh. knowing now what you're doing. Yeah. When we left, you said to us, you said, you know, I wasn't even going to do this meeting. I was supposed to be on vacation with my family. Mm-hmm. But I, and this your literal words were, yeah. I asked Spirit. Yeah, great Spirit. Yeah, I asked Great Spirit if I should meet with you. And Spirit said to me that that this would lead to something or something like that. Something bigger in the future. Something bigger right. in the future. And it's so we're funny. We're work together Yeah, somehow. not even all these podcasts. Yeah. I'm starting a podcast. Yeah. So we, and remember, I remember when you said that, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. 
now I'm like, that is, it's weird, but not because it's weird. It's weird because it's true. I am fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what the, the, the weird, the root meaning of the word weird, shaman were called weird, witches were called weird, but weird meant when somebody could do something or there was something that was unexplainable, but somehow fantastic or magical, that was what weird is. So like healers were weird people because they could sure. do things other people couldn't do. Weird didn't used to have a negative connotation. It meant you were some kind of powerful person. Hmm. And I'm not saying that I'm trying to brag about myself. I'm just saying I am weird. Yeah. I think you're pretty. I think you're pretty powerful. You did, yeah. did some one arm pull ups out in our studio at 57 years old. Pretty damn yeah, impressive. Well, you know, one arm pull ups. Yeah. I don't yeah. want you to think I'm a talking head here. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many of those. Yeah, there are a lot of those. Well, I'm, I'm, it's always a blast to have you on our show, and I'm. I wish you all the best. With hey, your I, I, I'm, it's it's always fun to come visit you guys. You know, I don't like to travel, as you know, but I must admit, I was up at four o'clock this morning, fucking giggling, going, "This is gonna be fun. I'm gonna go hang out with these yeah. guys, and I know they're gonna have something for me to put in the peace pipe for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we're gonna have a little powwow together, and 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 we're gonna share our love with the world. And I can't think at 57 years of really living a full intense life of study research hard knocks you know being a pioneer is not an easy path and i've put my balls out there um you know i'm like this is fun i'm gonna go i get excited because i really believe what you guys are doing is important mm. and uh, to be part of it and for you guys to share your stage with me and and give me the feedback that you love what I'm doing enough to keep inviting me back, that's important to me too because you guys are a younger generation than me. And one of the criticisms that I used to get labeled with all the time is, oh, Paul checks stuff old and outdated. So for, for you guys to be interested in it, it means... Oh, good. There are some people out there that have missed me. <laughs> no, no, you're cool. Yeah, you're yeah. cool. Trust yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. The young yeah. ones will love cool you, Uncle Paul. Uh, thanks for coming on, Paul. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. I love you guys, and I can't wait to interview you. Uh -huh. <laughs>